Sorry to keep you waiting. Not an issue. So without taking uh, much time, I would like to wish you all a bright morning and welcome back to the second day of the National Workshop on Research Trends in Women's Studies. On behalf of IQSC Mata Sundari College uh, and WDC Mata Sundari College and Women's Studies and Research Center, Ran Rani Durgavati Vishwa Vidyale, uh, Madhya Pradesh, I would like to extend my warm welcome to our eminent speaker for the session, Professor Bulbul Dhar James. For the, uh, also, it is uh, my privilege uh, that I'm actually welcoming ma'am and who has agreed to our invitation and took out, uh, took out her valuable time for this session. I also welcome all the participants uh, on the second day of the workshop. We are truly delighted to have you all with your active participant. Uh, this workshop would not have been uh, possible without the able guidance and leadership of our principal ma'am, uh, Professor Harpi Kaur, and our honorable vice chancellor of RD University, Professor Kapil Deo Mishra. Uh, Mata Sundari College have been organizing such series of webinars and all these online activities have been part of our uh, college uh, functioning. And this has happened post the pandemic. And this is actually an opportunity which we took. And uh, we had a fascinating and intriguing sessions in the uh, day one of the workshop. Many new dimensions of the research trends uh, related to women came up where we discussed, uh, which were discussed by our distinguished speakers. This has opened up new vistas for the researchers. And by now we have uh, set the tone of the workshop, but any research is incomplete without a theoretical argument and theoretical basis. So ma'am is today uh, going to fill up that gap uh, with her expertise in this area. Ma'am's topic will uh, be about gender equality, theory and activism in women's studies. Without taking much time, I would like to introduce our speaker for the session. Professor Bulbithar James uh, is a professor in the Department of Political Science, Jamia Millia Islamia, and she is also the former director of Sarojini Naidu Center of Women's Studies, Jamia Millia Islamia. She is a postdoctoral Fulbright Fellow on Global Political Economy and Governance. Professor James has done her PhD from the University of London as a Commonwealth Scholar. She has completed her MPhil and uh, PH, uh, MPhil and MA from the Center for Political Studies, JNU, and BA from Lady Sri Ram College, Delhi University. She has been coordinator for MA Human Rights Program in the Department of Political Science, and also MA Program for Arjun Singh Center for Open and Distance Learning. As a consultant at a National Council for Applied Economic Research, she coordinated a number of programs on economic and policy reforms in India. She has been actively participating in international uh, organizations like a UN Human Rights Council. She has also uh, been a program committee member at in, uh, International Conference in Political Science, Sociology, International uh, Relations, and have been organizing GSTF since 2012. She is besides on the advisory of many human rights organization and government panels. Her areas of research and publications includes gender and empowerment, human rights, political economy of globalization and governance, African studies. She is also a research person and content writer, Ministry of Human Resource Development, program of postgraduate e partial life in women's studies. And there are many more uh, uh, things to add, but without uh, taking much time, I now hand over the virtual mic to ma'am. Ma'am, please. Th thank you so much, Moitri. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to do justice to the theory because I'm really looking at theory and activism within women's studies. So I would like to deconstruct certain concepts, some of which might have been dealt with yesterday as well, but we'll, we'll take it from there. So uh, I'm just going to put forth my presentation.
Is that visible? जी मैम जी मैम विजिबल अभी अभी दिख रहा है yes ma'am yes ma'am we can see you so basically i'm i'm looking at uh, you know the idea of because the theme was so vast i didn't know where to stop uh so i i'm trying to weave in what all should be part of uh, women studies and what has been and what are the kind of trends and when i talk about research the research is action based research here in a lot of ways so we'll take it uh, from there so i'm i'm really you know uh, trying to weave in the whole concept of um, uh, you know uh, uh, the trends in women studies up to the pandemic and uh, ironically we are talking about research trends uh, i'm going to end with that so we we you know we are ironically talking about a time where women are otherwise so engaged in other kind of you know triple burden in a lot of ways but uh, i want to give a background and uh, i'm sure the history person would have done some of it but i'd like to put in perspective the fact of the emergence of the women studies as a discipline uh, has been uh, something which has been changing dramatically with the institutions that are coming in without uh, you know uh, any kind of contradiction there it's definitely an outcome of the national movement it's definitely an outcome of women's movement and from the 60s with a large number of women entering into uh, the profession along with minorities that's something we need to emphasize here while this has been a dictate of uh, you know the the time itself uh there have been changes in the way and the association with the waves of feminism which i'm going to link to as well in the forthcoming slides so in the 70s and 80s the second wave of feminism so uh, you know 60s was still the backlog of the first wave of feminism with women joining into institutions and professions 70s and 80s with the second wave of feminist mobilization there's a development of scientific uh you know kind of teaching and research about women's position in society and that whole idea of women studies as a perspective is uh, and the research that needs to be sought is actually focused on women's position in society to deconstruct that the scholarship on women uh has also grown in the existing discipline which is which of course the scholarship where more often than not is designated as feminist scholarship i'm mentioning this in inverted commas feminist scholarship because there is some dispute on this area or you will, we will have contradictions another thing i want to emphasize at the outset is that there's not just one feminism but many feminisms that we are speaking about when we look at you know the history of feminism and the way uh, women studies uh centers as such have really emerged and women studies as a discipline has emerged so while women's movement is is a much earlier phenomena the term feminism is a modern one so mid 19th century when the women's rights movement emerged in the us and other places especially in the us with the seneca falls convention of 1848 this was followed by the writings of many many feminists uh at that point who were you know just picking up women's rights activists not feminists at that point in time by the writings of people like elizabeth cady stanton stanton uh wallstone craft who questioned the many injustices meted out to the women hence the term feminism has emerged after women started questioning the uh, the inferior status and demanding a kind of a uh, an amelioration of their social position so many groups are not comfortable with the use of the term feminism and i want to emphasize that because uh, for them it uh, uh, did not identify their struggle from the women rights uh, you know with this term because of the way it has been perceived on the other hand we have so the notion of feminism itself we need to see it in this broad light comprises a number of cultural political social kind of movements theories and moral philosophies which are concerned with gender inequalities in a lot of ways 
uh, it has been an equal rights for women. One can clearly see that the history of feminism consists of three waves. And here, of course, we have the first wave, which is uh, uh, 60s and 70s, when pr first wave uh, in the early 20th century, mid 19th to early 20th century, primarily concerned with gaining equal rights for women, particularly suffrage. So it was really political and civil in some senses, like the human rights here. The second wave was uh, in the six, 1960s and 70s, where, where protests were centered around protests were centered around uh, women's inequality, not only in the context of women's political rights, but in the areas of family, sexuality, work. Uh, second wave of feminism has existed continuously since it's come into being. So even today we have overlapping second wave with the first wave of feminism that we are looking at in terms of the way it's been, you know, kind of perceived. It's coexisted with the third wave, uh, you know, in the larger context of looking at women's uh, movement. And, uh, you know, it is really with uh, uh, Carol Hanish's, you know, uh, proclamation of the personal is political, which uh, a, coin, a, a term that she coined that became synonymous with the second wave of feminism and was related to women's uh, liberation movement per se. The third wave extends from 1990s to the present and the movement arose as a response to uh, the perceived failures of the second wave. It was also a response to the backlash against uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, the initiatives and movements created by the second wave. The third wave seek to challenge or avoid the kind of uh, second wave essentialist definitions of feminism which according to them are emphasizing the experiences of the upper middle class women, also white women at that point in time that it's seeking to you know, uh, put into perspective. So the way women's studies has emerged from, <coughs> uh, has emerged from an opposition to creating a discipline to an acknowledgement of it. And today we are in a scenario where the acknowledgement has led to other kind of offshoots from it. So till the 1960s, we had the beginning of university students in social sciences did not receive any teaching about women's position and gender relations as part of their studies. In fact, the basis of this uh, negligence was uh, the fact that there was no doubt that women or the family were mostly seen as unrelated to the male dominated kind of universities. However, many of the questions that arose fell out of the bounds of the disciplines as it defined them. And that's how it came up. The field of uh, women's studies emerged from the site for investigating all these kind of questions, these questions, these issues, these concerns, which employed multiple research methodologies and experimented with pedagogies that took into account different kind of, uh, you know, gender differences in the learning styles as well. It was by the 70s that the introductory courses covered some aspects of, um, you know, this grew, women's studies grew rapidly in the 70s because introductory courses covered aspects of women hist women's history, an examination of the quant quantitative research on women's status, uh, selected readings of literary works by women and attention to issues largely absent from the overall uh, curriculum of social sciences where it was placed. So these issues also centered around, uh, you know, questions of oppression of women, sexual assault, uh, questions of marriage and family, the professional advancement of women, pay equity, representation of women in, in the media, amongst other topics. The third wave is uh, often termed as focused on micropolitics and challenged the second wave's kind of paradigm as to what is or is not good for females. So it became uh, uh, it became not a moral judgment, but a kind of a pathway uh, along which women's studies should proceed. The term was, was kind of a first use, uh, you know, uh, the term post-feminism was, was first used in the 1980s to signify a kind of a backlash against second wave feminism it now denotes a wide range of theories, some of which argue that postmodernism 
has destabilized the notion of universal uh, femininity and has taken a critical approach to the previous feminist kind of discourses. So some contemporary feminists have actually questioned it, consider feminism simply to hold that women are people, you know, that human dimension of women, views that separate the sexes rather than unite them, uh, they are considered by these writers to be sexist rather than feminist. So the differentiation between sexist and feminist also comes up. And it takes a number of forms of research in a variety of ways, uh, you know, within feminism or feminist geography, feminist history, feminist literary criticism within politics. The center of women's studies then becomes the nodal center. And in India, we can clearly see uh, you know, this link between research and the rise of certain ideologies and movements that, you know, kind of came into being. So, uh, so the beginning of, you know, when we are looking at it, the beginning of uh, uh, the composition or the change that is happening uh, uh, to women's studies and the opposition to women's studies as a university subject was very, very severe. Women's studies was accused of being too political, too unscientific. Feminist scholars answered that the male dominated sciences was itself biased and gender blind. So, you know, it was a tussle, which very often today when, you know, you, we are perceiving the way women's uh, studies has emerged or feminism has emerged is often pitted, you know, men versus women, which it is not. Uh, issues or concerns. Uh, uh, as a political economy person, I'm very, very uh, uh, emphatic about the fact that this notion from a political economy perspective, how could the economists really make a valid study of demand and supply, for instance, uh, of workers in a labor market, unless, you know, they were considering uh, uh, the, uh, the systematic se sex segregation that was happening of the workplace, and the gender related wage differences, which were not included in these studies. How could these be part of it? So as programs became departments and departments grew, the courses, you know, of course, developed in various ways. And uh, we had a lot of cultural studies links coming in media, ethnic uh, studies, gay and lesbian centers, which was later, later in the day, the most significant of the courses, uh, you know, offered at the undergraduate level occurred in the 1990s as the study of gender, race in India and subcontinent caste was added to the study of women. So we are drawing extensively from the history of women's movement when we look at the genesis of women's studies, especially in India, which is instrumental in articulating the question of women's history and shaping the feminist discourse. Feminist historiography, of course, is a very significant dimension, uh, has been developed with a declared agenda of not only making women visible in history, but also recording their contributions to various kinds of uh, social and historical processes. The, the idea behind uh, such an exercise is not only to make the women visible and also provide like a numerical count of women's participation in history, but also to develop a holistic understanding, uh, holistic and nuanced, uh, you know, kind of an approach towards knowledge production. So knowledge production is a major criteria of the kind of trends that you see in research that has been coming up. Knowledge production of a sort which is nuanced and that we see over a period of time is reacting reactions from a lot of perspectives to the kind of research that was, you know, kind of emerging. So uh, uh, the women's history is by and large, a large part of a complex process and the struggle for recognizing and visibilizing women's life. So therefore the genesis of women's studies uh, was really to integrate women's experiences into the dialectics of history. When we look at, you know, how uh, the stage is set in a sense and that's the next point of setting the stage for women's studies. It's, as I already said, a part of the women's movement. Uh, it aimed to provide information, 
analyze the lives of the women which could only end which would end their you know gender inequalities and women's subordination it would also critiques existing knowledge that existed uh, per se and uh, to show how and why women's lives views perspectives remain largely hidden so that whole cause of bringing that light shine the light on this perspective was uh, emerged this was an offshoot of uh, the concern of society towards women's situation and the problems that she was facing and its birth can be traced to a recognition of failure on part of the social scientists to inquire into women's uh, you know uh, issues their lack of questioning and assumptions theories and tools of analysis all of these uh, you know all these tools or whatever was used uh, um, you know were borrowed from the west and we needed to bridge this glaring gap in the data that might help orient the policy changes because the end result was to seek a policy direction which was different so that that would be part of it later we see how despite the policy direction or the laws coming into place in different ways there was still a lacune or a lag between uh, you know the two that we were looking at uh therefore um it was critiquing why and how of lives of the existing lives of women perspectives which were ignored in the academic disciplines that existed there this was um you know to actually led to the recognition of the need for women studies as an academic uh, discipline in the university system in india and institutions we had institutions like the iccr ICSSR uh, the women's movement itself played a very very crucial role in developing it besides women studies centers there are various other non academic you know kind of institutions which were state funded or part of this as part of the academic institutions these uh, you know centers initiated and funded by state governments you know kind of existed this was initially hence women studies was initially conceptualized as a branch of social sciences and humanities however today it's emerged as a discipline which has um, you know uh, gone beyond that a core it has developed its own core theory and a critical edge questioning existing concepts tools uh, techniques methodologies in the process it's been able to you know uh, question all of these uh um, uh that uh, all of these practices that render women marginal so that whole notion of marginalizing the women was seen to be something which you know uh, uh, uh was was sought to be you know resolved and generally the women studies therefore the the aim of the ugc women studies centers and i'll go back and forth in this uh was basically to strengthen of course women studies programs most importantly evolve a gender perspective in developing curriculum material now this uh, controversy of whether they should be women studies or gender studies which is something we'll come up with just now as well uh, the notion of bringing in a gender perspective in developing the curriculum material uh, research studies and extension activities was something which was definitely a mandate that ugc was uh, you know seeking to put in uh, place with women studies centers and uh, promote a gender just attitude among the academic community um, uh, you know uh, which is to be reflected in kind of attitudinal change and development of the students so the kind of students and the teachings that were brought in needed to be evolved the responsibilities you know of the center were really to um, uncover a lot of discrimination against women uh highlight significant areas of invisibility which existed uh you know um bring in uh field action bring in documentation extension activity organize volunteers from different areas you know look at areas of new definitions which needed to be brought in and methods incorporating gender consciousness into knowledge system so gender consciousness was a very very significant domain that was sought to be you know perceived uh from a practitioner's point of view and from somebody who seeks to bring about change within women studies we see 
a kind of a social responsibility that the uh, that the research or action based research had at the macro level of course empowering and developing women transforming their disciplines to include like a feminist perspective and at the micro level specifically increase women's visibility in universities and colleges in teaching research management by enhancing the ac academic strength and competence but this is not the way it evolves and i'm going to go for a bit on a tangent here to look at how beyond that it is really culture and society which is providing kind of space and boundaries for you know women and i want to say all genders to operate in in the spaces that they occupy spaces that could be and we'll deal with spaces spaces a very very significant uh, uh, domain that feminists look at in myriad ways it's not just physical space in myriad ways so space and boundaries within which we need to you know stay becomes something which was uh, which we needed to deconstruct because this was despite any kind of policy changes being brought in it was really um, you know the culture and society which was culture society sub society sub culture whichever place these were different the spaces that women in particular cultures uh, occupied could be different from other cultures sometimes diametrically opposite as well even the code of conduct and roles that uh, needed to be played were within the ambit of def defined in subtle ways in latent ways by culture and society so it was a time of you know opportunities as well as challenges for you know the emergence towards a new kind of a social setup and here we look at how patriarchy was so endemic in the cultures and very often we think that patriarchy is very south asian kind of a concept and it's it's not uh, there i don't have much time otherwise you know we could have shown this through other ways in which how patriarchy actually exists even in the west of today in in very very subtle ways where there's no recognition even though we think on the face of it it is leading to a change so uh, and so when we look at patriarchy we you know what do we mean it's a form of social organization where man heads and controls the family unit it is also <coughs> the man controlling large social and working groups within uh, you know the government and outside and uh, but having said that it is not male domination very often you know when you ask as a question what is patriarchy uh you know the immediate response is it's male domination i want to you know uh, contradict that uh, uh, common idea to say it is not male domination but it's domination of male values which are perhaps perpetuated by women more than men in various ways so the uh, so so because patriarchy is a a, a setup where the family or society where authority is vested in the males and through whom descent and inheritance is also traced it becomes something which becomes biased or obviously biased against women but i want to uh, kind of put in perspective that patriarchy equally and i hope satish did that yesterday equally deprives men and boys too perhaps in different ways and the roles that they play so you know we can't uh, you know look at it just in perspective of <coughs> it's against women so but uh here i want to just first focus on the implication of women of patriarchy is by virtue of control over her body over mobility mobility is treated like treated like a sinkona of security that you know uh, if you're mobile you're going to be going out at late at night you're going at your own risk the same is not to told to the boys wealth and property despite all kinds of laws being there we don't have women actually you know bringing up uh, uh, issues of wealth and property or filing cases against uh, their spouses or fathers or brothers or within the family because family becomes the most significant notion health education employment all of these are notions where women are definitely deprived still a part of sdgs the sustainable development goals was in mdgs it continues to be uh, we have organizations working for us um you know uh, with 1 billion rising against violence you know concerns like that and organizations called for instance from iit delhi calls three which is an entirely boys group because the girls don't exist even 
though they are toppers and there are some girls in the class, but they're not going to come because of uh, issues of mobility or other reasons that they're prevented and told to only focus on education. They won't come from the hostel and stuff like that. We're looking at times where employment opportunities. In fact, it's interesting that uh, when I take sessions on sexual harassment, for instance, you know, the resolution or what the learning that the corporates, if it's with a corporate that comes out is that the easiest thing for us, ma'am, they tell me is not to employ women, then we won't have any cases. So you know how the law actually works against women in a lot of ways as well, and how patriarchy is so seeped into it. Participation in decision making, very, very significant areas. If you have women in participation in decision making bodies, the policies and the laws will be different. So, uh, but the most debilitating thing for me, for, uh, you know, in this uh, notion of patriarchy is autonomy and self esteem, that women themselves feel lose because of the way the setup, the scenario, the families have kind of, you know, brought in this whole notion of understanding what it means uh, for you to do, what are the roles you need to play, what are your responsibilities, you know, honor lies with the woman, even though she's being raped and not with the rapist and a lot of other ways. So, and of course, as a direct outcome of that is a gender sex dichotomy where sex as uh, you know, we all know this is not a session on gender. So I, but I did want to bring this in because this determines the kind of research and action based research that is going to be done, where sex is of course biologically determined, universal given unchanging. Even that has changed with technology, you can have sex change operations and other issues. You're going to <coughs> just look at that and gender, which is socially constructed. So the problem is not in the sex of the person. The problem is in the gender, which you, me, all of us, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, society constructs with co complex cultural elements going into the construction. It is acquired. It is not something we are born with. It varies within cultures and across cultures. So this is the segregation, is something that we need to look at, which creates this whole issue of perhaps entitlement for the male, like in, uh, you know, popular cinema and media, uh, uh, a kind of a, uh, you know, uh, 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 a kind of a manifestation of the love, which is a lot of entitlement thrown in there. Or the whole mediaization, which is really worrying uh, in terms of, say, other films that come in, and uh, Tapar, for instance, where, you know, Tapasi Panu, who's a stay-at-home, you know, wife, who's could have worked, but she doesn't work, and she, you know, kind of labors over all his office assignments, she labors over his every need, like a normal, everyday couple, caring for his elderly mother, you know, stuff like that, it's, 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 uh, it's that turning point in their life comes when he gives her that one Tapar in a a party one day and uh, you know the protagonist here and the writer's con you know conviction here is that sp spousal abuse or any kind of abuse is once too many which is a very positive thing that we're looking at so ostensibly happy this tanu uh, switches off after that single slap that uh, and most people can't understand this they say you know Ek hi to hai. you know why do you have to and and even the husband, uh, you know, it isn't that he does this, he's a serial beater or anything like that, not at all. It's a very normal person. He himself says that shit happens, you know, it happens, people move on. So there's no, there's the sense of entitlement, that male entitlement is something that patriarchy has seeped into the way we are looking at it. Then the protagonist's inner journey is also reflected in all the women characters. I mean, I found this a very interesting, not a fantastic movie, but amazingly drawn out uh, patriarchy is deconstructed through various characters, whether it's the mother who says, and um, uh, the women characters, the mother-in-law who's silent, suffering mother-in-law, the maid who thinks that these things, the tappar and the beating only happens in her class of people and she sees it happening here. Uh, what's interesting is the shades of men also that patriarchy brings in or the way they approach issues, which is um, uh, Kumud Mishra as the father who's evolved, yet an evolving father. He is 
very feminist where his daughter is concerned, but he realizes as his wife points out to him that he's perhaps been patriarchal in various ways. Um, uh, you know, the husband is entitled in a sense, you know, haughty, entitled kind of a thing. But the whole, you know, notion of how patriarchy seeps in is something which, you know, kind of has in our social setup has created a kind of a masculinity. And this is another thing which, you know, in terms of research, which is being brought in in various ways. And I hope Satish dealt with it because Center for Health and Social Justice is working a lot on masculinity, issues of masculinity. And how the male sex roles, you know, this gender stereotyping that we do of this male, independent, powerful, competent, logical decision maker, breadwinner, and the other side, the female, who's dependent, weak, incompetent, and I'm talking about stereotypes here, because in a refresher course, when I'm doing a lot of people say, oh, ma'am, that's not right, we don't think like that. I'm talking about the common person on the street. I'm talking about, you know, this is an empowered audience. We need to look at it from, you know, that perspective as well. So uh, the female is a dependent, the weak one, the emotional one, emotional versus the logical male uh, supporter. She, she plays a supporting role. She's the peacemaker. Even now in, you know, democracies, when you look at it, this is something which is brought in to say that the roles that they play. So that whole association, I'm going back to sex and gender, where sex, which is associated with reproduction, and gender, which is associated with stereotypes, gross stereotypes and ideologies, values, beliefs, practices in religion, in culture that are gone, which become pro problem problematic, which are actually leading to a new sociology of masculinity as well. So where you have role a modeling of how a women needs to behave, it's equally so in terms of how men and boys need to do that. And, um, you know, Carrigan, Condi, Lee, Hacker, there's a lot of work done on the kind of roles that they play and the kind of hegemonic masculinity that exists where, you know, this male is seen as uh, 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 more often than not the strong, confident, tough. He needs to be the aggressive one, the one who needs to push forth his kind of, uh, you know, uh, notion of what is regarded as the breadwinner, the dominant one. You see in families where, you know, girls, elder sisters have to take little brothers along with them, accompany them to safeguard them. That little brother probably is, you know, scared and hiding behind the sister. But think of the psychology that the sister has that she has to accompany, that little brother has to accompany her for her safety. But more importantly, is the psychology of the little brother who grows up with this notion of having to be the provider, the leader, the tough one, uh, the strong one, the aggressive one, which leads me to the way media kind of projects this in other ways. And to me, one of the most obnoxious kind of misogynistic kind of Indian films, which did which not surprisingly did the roars of business. And I saw this in a cinema hall before the pandemic. And I was aghast at the talis and the CTs and the claps that were coming at the most obnoxious of the places for this misogynistic to toxic hero who, who kind of, uh, who's an abuser of women. He's an insensitive, loud, alcoholic. You know, he takes a claim on his girlfriend, moves her to the boys' hostel. Then he slaps again. I mean, I'm going on to the slap, which more in physical terms of, you know, violence, but it could be other ways. He slaps the heroine and he says, who knows you in this college? Your identity is that you're my girl. So that whole notion of ownership, you know, is a constant that we are, you know, faced with. But this wasn't all we had. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with, despite all kinds of things that we are speaking about trends in research, in you know, bringing about other notions we had in our own very city here in a public school from our class of people, young adolescent boys who started a WhatsApp group called Boys Locker Room. And uh, it's very worrisome because this was um, a, a whole notion of how we needed to look at this because they were talking about raping their classmates, girls in their own class. They were not talking about having sex. It was not some kind of uh, hormonal pleasure they were seeking. They were connecting sex with violence, not some kind of orgasmic pleasure, you know, that happens hormonally. The problem is that the pleasure was from the violence. And that's the kind of psyche 
which is you know becoming part of our thinking masculinity based on one person's pleasure not both person's pleasure it's a sad misconceived reality of sex as a one way stream you know no notion of choice even now we are debating whether marital rape can be rape or can be uh, against the law you know that whole notion of shifting the kind of onus so somewhere i think how quickly in life can we start talking about sex about consent consent a very very significant thing boundaries equality with children teenagers young adults because because of the exposure they're growing up too soon so if, if we say nirbhaya was a glaring glaring example of you know juvenile kind of repugnant sexual violence and very often we say oh the bringing was bad what are bringing are we talking about when we are talking about in public schools young adolescent boys talking like this it's the same so there's something wrong in our education system are we not bringing that in you know boys locker room in fact you know represents this kind of violence indeed masculinity which exists in the imagination of the youth so you know this is also something which is being deconstructed and a lot of research happening because toxic masculinity becomes a part of uh, you know that notion of creating that man where he can't cry where he can't express his emotions where he has to be violent he has to be aggressive not you know uh, i wish he was told to be assertive like girls are taught and on the other hand girls are keep quiet and you know a lot of cases that we get of sexual harassment also it's genuinely the boy the the accused has believed that he's been led on because the girl has not been vociferous in saying that no and that's something we need to emphasize in our society with our girls and boys that you know you really need to do that in various ways so this kind of you know notion of consent it isn't to ha kar ya na kar to hai meri kiran there has to be an idea of you know we might accept this a lot of people say oh ma'am but sharukh khan was a psychopath in the movie if he was believe me there are lots of psychopaths roaming around in society because we have asset throwing still going on we have all kinds of you're not able to take a no because your sense of entitlement is so strong and this is just so worrisome that we need to bring that as part of the research which goes in so the whole notion of prescriptive masculine stereotypes which need to you know which which uh, kind of reaffirm reassert which maintain gender hierarchy by ensuring that boys and men are trained and reinforced for behavior that keeps their status higher you know there's a hierarchy that they are leadership oriented they are the decision makers they are the dominant ones achievement oriented behavior we we all you know as parents brothers sisters teachers mentors whatever we need to speak about cyber bullying we need to speak about peer pressure we need to speak about consent we need to speak with our young ones we need to first we need to understand it ourselves also we need to speak about understanding boundaries and i don't mean like the lakshman rekha that the honorable prime minister sp spoke about during covid for lockdown you know other kind of boundaries that uh, you that exist and what kind of boundaries even in terms of relationships uh, pleasure of the equal not just consensual but welcome sex for instance so we need to build models of consent so an incident like nirbhaya reinforces the fear or even the boys locker room it's so similar so there is an understanding that you know women need to be empowered we constantly speak about i think women are pretty much getting empowered and know where they are the men need to be able to cope with their empowerment in various ways and that coping needs to come in uh, you know not by uh, you know you can't disempower them by taking away their cell phone or telling girls you shouldn't wear jeans stricter laws and penalties cannot be ways to keep women safe women and girls safe while it's a valid concern we need to understand why it's happening what is the deterrent value what needs to be looked at and you have uh, funk and verner and a lot of other work one of the initial work that was done but a lot of work on these kind of issues has been done by other uh, kind of authors as well looking at the instrumental versus the expressive notions where of course the instrumental is the male masculine adventurous dominant forceful versus the expressive which is sentimental submissive superstitious feminine you know that whole notion of feminine needs to be brought into the fore so somewhere we need to understand 
because violence against women is a huge area of research which has been brought in that violence is not simply a physical or a biological act even though i dealt with it as a thappad it's just symbolic of it's located in our social and social and cultural context it is located in the psyche that we are creating it's located in the patriarchy which we are multiplying each time that we are doing and the kind of descriptive and prescriptive stereotypes that are emerging in terms of what ought to be the conformist rules that need to be applied the prescriptive masculine stereotypes which is more rigid than the feminine one i you know and i feel for the men and boys here because each time we are passing the buck on to them but they are perhaps even more deprived in a study that was done of adolescent male boys it seems that adolescent sexual abuse of adolescent male boys was much more than girls but they had not been able to speak up and even when they did it was with such hesitation because they were not fitting into that stereotype those boxes that we've created you me all of us have created so where you have prescriptive feminine stereotype you have male ones which are perhaps um, you know and if you don't fit into that you're not man enough or you're even labeled as gender deviant Uh, which is not so easy for women within women but in men it is so much so so the hierarchy that this uh, you know assumes is something we you know really need to fit into place so i think the research areas that emerged out of this kind of a social scenario that we are looking at became very very linked to the kind of society that we were so in terms of uh, you know research areas of histories of women's movement women studies feminism as a historical perspective but definitely patriarchy and its implications in other ways and today we have a lot of studies on the pandemic and how <coughs> how it's impacting uh, the women and we can speak about you know research uh, of women studies but believe me during the pandemic especially in the last two years it's gone down majorly because of the triple burden that the women face perhaps men are producing more in terms of literature and stuff like that so you have migration studies so you have minorities uh, ethnicity labor laws you know all of these um, sex ratios we are looking at political economy gender indicators violence against women we already mentioned conflict so gender as a conflict so the movement even within women studies is to look at gender now and um, uh, you know in terms of that human rights scenario even look at where you're looking at patriarchy and its impact you are looking simultaneously at issues other issues which are related issues like caste like ethnicity like migration like masculinity like lgbtq plus plus so we have the kind of approach of women studies in the center especially is is as catalysts you know to promote women studies through teachings through research uh in socially relevant areas networking within and outside the university system uh you know um, evolving field action dissemination of knowledge research training all of this you know kind of emerges and the broad aims of course remain uh for women studies teaching field action research dissemination advocacy and training so even the research that is there is action based research but i can't do a whole uh, i can't be dealing with this without mentioning that it's not a binary and the future is definitely a non binary we need to move beyond these binary kind of situations of social identity to look at it beyond men and women to trans people and many others that you know we we are just going to look at in terms of of course as i told you boundaries behaviors roles expectations and entitlements perhaps the worst of are the trans people whose whose spaces are so limited and the roles that they play become so limited despite any laws being in place we need to move beyond that um, you know the cis gender person a cis gender person is whose gender identity and expression matches the sex that they are assigned at birth and the cis gender is according to the prescribed expectation of society and cis gender also enjoy privileges as their identity is treated as a default identity anything which is beyond that default identity becomes deviant 
And that's something we need to recognize and move beyond because we need to look beyond this uh, gender binary to look at sexual orientation and gender identity, whereby gender identity is the person asking themselves, am I a man or a woman? And this was done beautifully in a, a film which was in, on Netflix or Amazon, I can't remember, called Disclosure where one of the characters says, I want the outside of me to match the inside of me. That really makes us understand what it is because we might see a person as somebody and this was brought out very well in um, Satyamev Jayati, that interview of Ghazal by Amir Khan. And if you can, please do, do look at that as well, where your identity could be transgender, transsexual, transvestite. You know, I, I'm not even sure I know exactly what each of them means. So we need to understand and recognize, you know, intersex, gender fluid, gender non-binary. So that's the identity. And on the other side is sexual orientation, which means who do I love? Do I love a man or a woman? So lesbian, gay, bisexual, asexual, heterosexual, pansexual, all of this comes into being. And we are looking at places today which are completely gendered. Their work and spaces where work is gendered, where men are expected to do the work outside the home, <coughs> where the women do work outside the home and unpaid work, in some paid work outside the home and unpaid work at home. Domestic work is seen as women's work. Political systems are gendered where more often than not the hard, harder portfolios go to the men. This government has been trying to make a difference by having finance and defense uh, with a woman minister, but uh, at a general level, uh, uh, quantitatively, this is not something which has been um, the normal that we are looking at. So ideally, that whole notion of spaces being gendered becomes something which we really need to, you know, undercut through our uh, action research, where men predominate private spaces and women are the, pri uh, sorry, public spaces and women are the private spaces. Market space is uh, male and uh, kitchen is female. So you had this kind of social space scenario of which is constantly a vicious circle which evolves with the way we are deconstructing patriarchy, creating hegemonic masculinity, socialization is gendered, power inequality is very, very gender biased. And in a lot of ways, we are looking at this, a multiplier effect of this. And the problem here is not gender. The problem is gender inequality. The difference is not the problem because gender inequality puts women in disadvantages position vis-a-vis -vis men, puts men in disadvantages position and one bit which has got cut puts the trans people and the others in the most disadvantages position because you don't even want to speak about it. And this is something which is getting written about in a lot of ways. And, you know, we need to put that in that larger perspective. I think I've really uh, eaten into the time. How much time do I have? Do I, uh, about 10 minutes? Uh, Ma'am, we also will have a short question and answer room. Maybe in our next five minutes. Okay, so I'll, I'm just going to quickly wind up as much as I can. And uh, so we're coping with the new normal here which is uh, not something that we, you know, uh, uh, have any knowledge of in terms of a background or experience and each of us are learning. The good thing is that you have female leaders in COVID-19 times have probably been more successful in curbing it in terms of the very gender stereotypical characteristics that we attribute to the women. It's interesting that we do that. But Nonetheless, COVID-19 has exacerbated the already existing gender kind of inequalities, the emerging norm of work from home, uh, closure of offices, educational institutions, uh, you know, online education, lack of services of domestic help, the need to perform unpaid chores at home at the household has increased. And all of this more often than not has a notion of sexual division of labor. So simultaneously you have the requirement of social distancing that has to happen, sanitization that has created more unpaid work. Let's face it, these might be something that we joke about but it's creating so much more work which has to be dealt with. 
and because of the sexual division of labor and gendered roles and social norms uh, of performing this domestic work care work unpaid work disproportionately the women are kind of bearing the brunt of it and the impact of covid-19 on time spent and uh, that's time studies which i do want to mention you know from a political economy perspective that spent on unpaid work and the underlying gender differences in the urban centers in india is tremendous where a comparative analysis of the gender differences on the time spent during the lockdown and uh, you know the reasons for it are obviously these so the increased burden of unpaid work on the women you know what in uh, the literature is called time poverty leaving little or no time to the women to undertake productive activities a lot of research is being done along these lines uh, you know no leisure no choices you know it's not as if they have a choice being the women uh, they are governed by certain rules and it's not as if they have a choice because somebody has got to do the work even if it is shared it's still added burden which happens so a uh, time poverty is like the burden of competing claims on an individual's time that reduces their ability to make unconditional choices on how they allocate their time leading to trade off of various tasks whether they allocate it for work or for publishing for research so i found this topic a little ironic that you know there will not be time the burden of unpaid work is so much that it prevents women from participating in paid labor and social activities thus feeding into their low status the implication of this is that these chores fall in the category of unpaid labor are physically exerting and time consuming and lots of studies done but i'm just going to gloss over that and basically the triple burden that women are subjected to becomes limited opportunities for them the triple burden of unpaid work reproductive work paid employment all these have to be done because that's part of the existence at this point in time all these determine the kind of uh, you know notion of how the burden happens but having said that we have a ray of hope in reversing the gender roles also this is a time that maybe a lokesh is helping at home manish who i can see here and other people also much more because of a lack of choice and because you understand that more being at home so maybe this reversal of gender roles which is really stereotypical roles which should not be ideally you know part of the women's burden so to say policies making as flexibility is working so there are certain other areas which you know we can't but kind of uh, 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 ignore so generally before the pandemic and through the time it was looking at a lot of notions which are very very interdisciplinary so that whole critiquing you know down to uh, queer theory to discourses uh, post structuralism all these become part of it so it's a discipline beyond you know uh, uh, the field of pure feminist and interdisciplinary methods it is social cultural constructs also which are being questioned it is looking at sexual orientations as i said socio economic classes disability a whole lot of justice the area of law biopolitics you know surrogacy uh, the whole uh, notion of gmo and the impact eco feminism the fact that you know they are pr probably bearing the brunt of it in that larger sense of the term and uh, and are but having said that are women publishing less during the pandemic yes they are across disciplines women publishing rate has fallen dramatically and these results are consistent throughout the world so you know even though we are speaking about this it is a time that women are so burnt out and exhausted under pressure more than men perhaps that mckinsey study has you know kind of shown has surveyed lots of companies and it shows uh, also at an academic level female faculty on an average shoulder more teaching responsibilities sudden shift of you know online teaching then curriculum and other stuff because mostly they might be there as tokenism in policy making bodies where the men are so their time is spent on that and less laborious in that sense of the term so i just want to end it with to say that the researches really are in a sense deconstructing structures which we need to do are deconstructing systems deconstructing stereotypes deconstructing gender in various ways 
and trying to construct equality. I'm just going to end with the <laughs> an evocative note to say that this is my life my life of expectation, my world of expectations, of do's and don'ts, of belonging, of relationships, in relationships that are inviting others compulsive, others some demanding, and yet others controlling. These are relationships and roles bring forth a whole range of feelings, intimacy, nurturing, fostering, love and affection. All these are part of women's activities that they do anger and resentment, which we hold within us. We, I, you, me, all of us become captive of one and ignore the other, leaving turmoil and doubts and anguish. And these multiple roles and relationships push and pull me in many directions. And I often lose each of us, any gender. I often lose touch with my being, my process of becoming, my search to e discover equations in relationships and well-being. I often lose touch with my space, space in its myriad ways. And most importantly for me, I often lose touch with my rhythm with the self. Thank you all. Thank you so much, ma'am. And you have done justice in such a short time. You have uh, connected all the dots and you have showed us uh, new uh, dimensions and which will help uh, future researchers to take women's studies ahead. And uh, I would like to take a question quickly from Harinder Sandhu ma'am. She has put in two questions. So one of the question is, uh, there's a question born out of total ignorance. So please be indulgent. Are there no movements before the 20th century which fit the definition of feminist movements or do we exclude them? There's that one more question from ma'am. Uh, also, your comment on the relationship between patriarchy and internalized misogyny. The first question, please be indulgent to me because I have not been able to cover so much of domain and there definitely it's there. But one thing I'd really like to emphasize is they're not, there isn't one, the women's movement is there, but it isn't one feminism. There are many feminisms. So that recognition of feminism has been throughout. In fact, you know, there's no end to how, how back in time we can go. It definitely exists there. And uh, uh, it's a lapse on my part, but in that limited time, you know, I had to start somewhere. I, so I started. It, it wasn't meant to be, it wasn't calling you out. As I said, it is a question. No, but but, but this is something we need to recognize that it might not have been called a women's movement, but yeah, there were lots of issues yeah. which were in place. Yeah, and yeah. we need to recognize that because very often it's true, because I, I'm a human rights person more than women's rights, because I really feel that it needs to, you know, the inclusivity will only come if we, if we look at, you know, like women very often, you know, uh, when you talk about any kind of uh, laws, uh, people, you know, throw back and say that, oh, domestic violence, oh, women just file wrong cases. Sexual harassment, they file wrong cases. I want to say, hello, it's men, women. Yes, women might file. So do men. Other cases, if they're human. <laughs> so each of us would do it. So when we make that exclusive, the issues there. And uh, internalized misogyny is something which is we are still replicating it. We are replicating it in our thinking. It's happening. I mean, Boys Locker Room is last year. We have, uh, you know, this film did not do so well on its own. It was this kind of misogyny that people appreciate. They think this, it's normalized. It's normalized constantly. We don't question it. We don't, you know, that whole notion of boys will be boys. We don't question it. And the poor things also fall into that category of, you know, where is my space? What is my, um, you know, rhythm with myself? Do I actually, you know, am I in this space? Can I be emotional? Can I express myself? Comes in in various ways. So I think patriarchy, uh, you know, you have another notion which uh, people like Madhu Keshwar and all say that, you know, patriarchy on its own is not bad. And when I think about it, yeah, maybe she's got a point there. What she's trying to say is that as long as the patriarchs do what they're expected to do, but what is happening is we have study and I was a part of the study um, uh, done by TIS and, um, uh, you know, which brought un and save the children. And uh, it brought forth a glaring statistic of sexual abuse of adolescent girls 
And the horrific statistic was nearly 50 percent, 49 some percent. And this was done in eight states in India. And this is about five years, six years back. I've talked to certain fathers there as well, where sexual abuse of adolescent girls, nearly 50 percent was by the biological fathers. So if I say that in a refresher course, people will say, oh, your statistics is wrong, your methodology is wrong. Then I have to say, even if it is 2%, how sick is that? We are the kind of society that we are tolerating this and it's happening. You know, I spoke to one father, I stay in Gurgaon and as part of uh, the research, spoke to one father who told me in crude Haryanvi that I have borne the fruit. Uh, so I will, uh, I will bear the, uh, you know, it, it was just so sick that, you know, and, and there wasn't, there was no shame in it. He was, he thought I was idiotic asking him something like this. And we are still living in a setup which, you know, where it exists in this way. We all, whether women's studies or any kind of studies, we all, especially as teaching faculty, really need to do so much to make that difference, to make that change that should come about. So um, entirely, I mean, it's, it's just being replicated. I don't know whether it's going down. So that's something which is worrisome. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am. Ma <laughs> <I'm so sorry. laughs> no, ma'am, thank you so much. And I wish I could continue and we move on with the discussion. But uh, we are running behind of time and we have the valedictory session as well. And the next uh, guest has already uh, joined with us. So without taking much time, I would now request uh, Dr. Manisha Mathur to please uh, uh, give us a vote of time. Thank you. Thank you, Moitri. And this has been such a wonderful session. Uh, we, I wish we could just, uh, you know, you could go on and on and uh, because uh, you have traced so beautifully uh, the trajectory of uh, the women's movement and succinctly talked about women's studies as a discipline, the areas of research and how it is uh, extremely interdisciplinary. And you've talked about things uh, that we as a society need to take cognizance of, you know, the kind of patriarchy uh, that is steeped in our society, the gendered society that we live in. Um, so yes, a lot of research is going on and a lot of research needs to go into all this. And ma'am, we are extremely grateful to you. You've always been so gracious in accepting our invitation. Last year also you were here for our national uh, webinar series and we hope to invite you to our college when uh, the university resumes, uh, you know, functioning in the physical mode so that uh, we can benefit from your erudition. So thank you so much. And I also take the opportunity to thank our principal, Professor Harpreet Kaur. Uh, Ma'am, we are truly beholden to you as well because you uh, encourage us to organize all these academic activities and uh, you always, uh, you're there for us and you've been uh, supporting us. So uh, that is why the you know, environment in the college has become extremely enriching. And uh, thank you, Moitri, for this flawless moderation uh, of the session. And I would also like to thank our rapporteur, uh, Dr. Simmer. And thank you to all the participants for diligently attending these sessions. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. And back to you, Moitri. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much, ma'am, and thank you, uh, thank you, you for this Actually, opportunity. I might just stay on to uh, hear the yeah, other sure, ma'am. Uh, this is so, yeah, sure, ma'am, sure. Ma you, now ma I hand over the mic to sir. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Bulbul, ma'am. Uh, uh, next session co conduct करने के लिए मैं Dr. Kiranji Sethi से request करूँगा. Dr. Kiranji Sethi, Department of English, was senior faculty है. Dr. Kiranji Sethi. Thank you, Lokesh. Thank you. And Kirinjit Sethi as Lokesh Kouldi from Department of English, Madhya Sindri College. And I hereby take this opportunity to welcome you all to the valedictory session of the two-day national workshop on recent trends in women's studies. Organized by IQAC Madhya Sindri College, Women Development Cell Madhya Sindri College, along with Rani Durgavati University, Chabri. This workshop began yesterday, where we had eminent scholars and speakers like Dr. Satish Kumar Singh and uh, Dr. Pallavi Jain Govil and Dr. Kusum Lata Malik. They addressed this issue and they opened up new visitors, new dimensions to the research trends. We had Dr. Bulbuldar James today, very enriching, very stimulating lecture on uh, because of presentation. 
and she presented her views on gender equality theory and activism very stimulating and, and i think uh, full of knowledge and uh, all appreciation i think will fall short the way you clearly put forth your views thanks so much and to, now in this valedictory session we feel proud to announce that we have amongst us an erudite scholar and a condition for excellence and a qualified writer dr shalina mehta dr shalina mehta is professor of social anthropology in the department of anthropology punjab university chandigarh she did her phd from university of delhi on hindu muslim relations in sadar bazar of delhi a study of identity making mechanisms a university position holder throughout she has been a recipient of a number of fellowships scholarships and international and national honors she has been nominated to various national and international academic bodies like she has been nominated thrice to academic council punjab university to research degree committee in home sciences fellows society for applied anthropology usa member iuaes commission on women professional women's advisory board by the american biographical biographical institute usa then on she is on the subject panel of anthropology she is an expert external expert on social assistance program of department of anthropology uttar university she is on the editorial board of journal of tribal studies executive committee of ethnographic and folk culture society of lucknow then academic council university of delhi the burning body of indian national academy of social sciences on editorial board of trade publications and many more having the teaching experience of more than 37 years she has supervised and awarded seven phd's phd thesis and 35 msc dissertations she has to her credit 11 meritorious and important very prestigious projects dealing with subjects as diverse as sunni muslims in india then separatist tendencies in rural punjab ethnographic profiles of tribals of district of mandala of madhya pradesh and also of himachal pradesh then rehabilitation and development in narmada valley transnational environmentalism and in country environmental organization in collaboration with dr priscilla weeks and extensive work on hiv aids where she has presented a few papers also one of them i can uh, quote which is written on cinderella planning care strategies for the girl child of patients of hiv and aids and most of these projects were awarded funded sponsored by prestigious agencies like ugc icss and other international organizations she is a member of various scientific academic bodies she is a founder member of indian national confederation and academy of anthropologists this was founded in 2004 and it served as an umbrella organization for the community of anthropologists as i mentioned earlier also she has a teaching experience spanning more than 37 years and apart from teaching the regular papers which are there in the curriculum she has also introduced many courses like anthropology of management medical anthropology research methods psychological anthropology social demography anthropology ecology and environment just to name a few an author of numerous research papers and books she has also had many important citations from them she has organized and attended various seminars workshops conferences both at international and national levels man with such an impressive and awesome bio data i only hope that i have not missed out on anything by introducing you welcome ma'am on this session and we also have our college principal professor dr hrithi goramanstas our inspiration and guiding light she's always encouraging and motivating us and thank you ma'am for being there to support us always 
and we also we had Professor Rajeshwari Rana. I'm not sure whether she's here or not today, uh, right now. And uh, she's from Women's Studies at Rani Durgavati University. I welcome all the eminent personalities and the attendees who have joined us for the session. And I think all the attendees must be waiting to listen to your erudite lecture now. So I will not take much of the time and hand over the virtual mic to you. Professor Shalina Mehta, please. Thank you so much. Uh, you almost embarrassed me. <laughs> made me feel this is your work which speaks for itself. There, there is really nothing much. I think as academics, when we spend so much time uh, doing research, doing something uh, on the ground, uh, well, we add to it. But I am indeed uh, grateful to Principal Harpreet Kaur, Principal of Mata Sundari College, Vice Chancellor of Durgavati University, Professor Rajeshwari Rana of uh, Women's Studies Research Center, Rani Durgavati University, and you, of course, ma'am, for uh, <laughs> adding so much value to my humble being. Uh, Manisha Mata was cleaner and brilliant. Um, you know, I've been listening to her yesterday morning session, then a lot of what Bulbulha was speaking just now. Uh, it's indeed, and of course, uh, to my very, very dear little sister, as I have always called her, Hanu. Dr. Harinder Sandhu, who just brought me in and said, you have to come and say something uh, a week ago. Um, I, you know, I've been to your college once before and believe me, it was such a pleasure because there's so much of brilliance all around uh, that uh, any invite to get back and have a conversation or a dialogue with you people is always that I, uh, look forward to. I was also indeed uh, very delighted to know that um, I'll, uh, we have this seminar is being co-organized uh, by uh, Rani Durga with the University Jabalpur. And I have uh, very pleasant memories of having organized uh, a series of seminars with them way back in 1989. Uh, it's, it's certainly a nostalgic moment because uh, when I was listening to yesterday's speaker, a lot of those memories were coming back to me. And I thought my task was made much easier uh, because then I can just go back and reflect on it. Now, those three seminars that we organized uh, were one was in Mandala that uh, Palveji was referring to yesterday. The other was in Malachkan, which is an open mining complex. And the third was on the Rani Durgavati campus. These were organized in September 1989. Uh, these were part of a grassroots initiative across the country to empirically map India's tribal situation, quote unquote, because I don't use the term tribal. Uh, for me, tribal is a colonial construct, and uh, we often, uh, you know, uh, forget the diversity that various communities clapped under this. There are about 700 of them today. Uh, they're so diverse linguistically, culturally, uh, that it's just not possible to talk about them under one particular subhead. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the webinars we had in 1989 were eye-openers in several respects because uh, we had actually gone uh, to the Adivasi areas. Prior to that, uh, I hadn't really worked uh, among the Adivasi communities. I had spent most of my time in Delhi. And as Kirinji mentioned, I started my research by talking about Hindu-Muslim relations in Delhi, which was a very, very different uh, exercise. I am also... Uh, perplexed at the moment when I heard the uh, uh, previous speaker, Babu, you know, uh, the entire presentation of hers was brilliant, but it was so uh, 
it was so autoethnographic, I would say, because it was conditioned by a middle class perspective. It was conditioned by the way urban women think and present their case in a women's studies department. And that is why there is this whole uh, question of deconstruction. This discourse of human rights uh, is uh, actually more about, in my opinion, as an anthropologist, about cultural rights and not so much about human rights. Because the moment you take a universal discourse of uh, human rights, you're again uh, you know, influenced and enamored by the logic of those, uh, of those who are talking about or forgetting or dismissing the cultural values. So unfortunately, what I felt a little disturbed about in the morning was that while we so much focus was being put upon um, how as urban middle class women, we missed out on publications, we've been sitting at home last two years, uh, not really been able to add much value to our work, we simply forgot about those women who were working on the roads, how they had lost their livelihood uh, what had happened to them or uh, to their uh, li uh, livelihoods, how they were spending, because the, you know, if you see the Menorega figures for last year, most of the work has actually gone to men who returned back to their communities. So these are very, very complex issues. Uh, but because I'm a person from the field, I'm a grounded researcher. I'm not really uh, into too much of uh, you. I use theory, but I'm not so much into uh, talking about it in hypothetical terms. And I've also often said that I'm very much a, 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 a storyteller. So when uh, I honestly don't know from where to begin today and how to close this very, very complex and uh, uh, intricate debate that we've started or you've uh, given rise to. Because yesterday when uh, Alviji was talking about, she talked about certain things which spelled out and I thought I was going to speak today to you from a researcher's perspective as to how she's talked about disruptive research and said we should be doing disruptive research. So I wanted to talk to you about the kind of research we've been doing, which is, I don't call it disruptive, I call it proactive research. But then you see the gap that exists between those who implement policies and those who do research on the ground. The kind of communication gap that exists between the administrator, the policy planner, which again reflected in uh, the previous speaker's presentation because we remain so focused on how the urban milieu works. Do we really realize uh, that there is such a huge gap uh, between what people in these Adivasi communities or what their cultural values or lifestyles were, then what is happening in urban areas. So when you talk about gender gaps, let me begin with that. What is it that we're talking about? She made a passing statement yesterday that women in, uh, you know, the sex ratio in Adivasi areas is actually better than the rest of the country. Now, the fact is that uh, in these uh, Adivasi communities, women indeed enjoyed a relatively better status way back in 1989 when I went to these areas for the first time in my life. There was really, you know, not the kind of cultural constructs we have. They were neither shy. They were the ones who participated in all activities. And the issue of, uh, you know, they, there was no question of dowry. They were being paid bride price for bringing a woman into the house. 
they were not the kind of sexual uh, mores that governed the middle class women and they were free to practice whatever they wanted to uh, there was no control so the first story that i wish to share with you is that when we started doing these interventions with a a kind of a biased view with the gaze uh, which is very very restricted to our own perspective and i often call it a textbook view uh, we don't really look at the realities of what these populations were experiencing so the story is of a 1989 of a adivasi woman who used to come and help us i had taken about 30 of my students to the field so one day she came and she was very very disturbed she had a 8 year old son so we asked her what happened to you and she said she's been thrown out of her house so we said why she's been thrown out of the village now these villages they had community properties the, there was no question of individual land holdings both men and women worked shared the in the evenings they ate together they danced uh, so it was not really a kind of a typical traditional middle class morality that we are all accustomed to so the custom of the society was that a man or a woman can get into a relationship but if she is exploited outside by anybody outside the community she will no longer be accepted as the member of the community so what happened she was raped by her previous employer who happened to be a forest officer there and then uh, she had a child from him and when the community came to know about it they said you are excommunicated from the community so he was a position that we had taken that the community said no you're being exploited by somebody who's not a member of the community so you haven't had those kind of sexual rights uh, which other women in your group enjoy when i revert back to that what has happened after our interventions planning uh, so much of uh, money and effort that has gone into uh, so called adivasi development uh, some of which was being referred to yesterday by pallavi ji is the fact that we introduced certain values we introduced certain controls which were never really part of those communities or those societies and as a consequence of that sadly <clears throat> the maximum number of women who come to the brothels today happen to be from some of these adivasi localities so somewhere when we assumed this universal discourse of human rights we tried doing interventions which were uh, not really in consonance with the cultural values of those organizations we we again had a universal kind of a model to deal with it that all these discrepancies emerged which created a lot of tension not only in those com communities and societies but also pushed them further into margins Now the models that you aspired for, the models that you built, were actually meant to, quote unquote, to improve their status, to improve their value systems. When uh, the previous speaker was talking about uh, Thapper, the movie Thapper, I recalled a story by Mahadevi Verma, where she had a house help who was being beaten every day. and she offered to bring her home and take care of her two children and the lady refused and she says no that is what by uh, you know that is home for me this is never going to be home for me so one of the problems i think in gender studies we've had is you know you're asking me to talk about two areas on which i have worked for decades and i honestly i just don't know how to um uh, I have to sort of uh, coordinate my thoughts in both the domains as such. 
So the problem was that this is a model that we've been trying to impose on communities who have very different perspectives, who have very different perceptions of themselves. The question, because we haven't studied enough those communities, or even if we have studied, we've not published enough. Another reference that was being made yesterday, and I speak on behalf of many of you sitting here. There is a huge problem of what kind of research gets recognized. And it's not only in the context of gender, but it is also in the context of every other kind of publication. And since I'm addressing some people from, uh, I'm sure there must be some participants from Jabalpur, uh, people who write in local languages. Uh, so a reference was being made by ma'am yesterday that there is no data available, there is no research being done. And she referred particularly to sickle cell anemia. But the fact is, and I did mention, because when I went to Manla in uh, 1989, and prior to that in 88, uh, I knew that there was an ICMR center in Jabalpur, which was researching sickle cell anemia. And yesterday I tried doing some Google search and I said, how come when she ran there in 1999 as a collector, she didn't know that there was a center, ICMR center in Jabalpur, which had been researching on sickle cell anemia for more than 10 years there. And exclusively on the communities that for which she was expected to plan her intervention strategies. And I went back to data yesterday and found there are two publications of ICMR, 87 and 89, uh, which are published in ICMR's journal. The reason she wasn't able to probably locate those studies was that they are not really part of the, it was not a Lancet study or it was not a nature study uh, that would instantaneously come to your attention. So a lot of studies published in Lancet and Nature, I have my reservations about some data that they use or some research is applied to them, but that's another altogether another question. So why is it so that the researchers and the administrators or the policy makers are working in silos? And the only kind of people who are involved and engaged in policy making are the English speaking, who publish in quote unquote indexed foreign journals because the Indian journals are not to be recognized as international journals. When it comes to a lot of data about um, local communities, if you pick up master's dissertations, if you pick up PhD theses of these students, uh, from those universities which are probably gathering dust in their libraries, you find there is humongous amount of data that you can possibly use for policy intervention, for evolving perspectives on how these communities have to be dealt with. And for those of you who are specifically engaged with gender issues, you know, I again want to take you back to another story. When after Beijing, all these intervention programs started and uh, some of our very renowned women researchers, uh, women activists, I would like to call them, were going to these communities. The women in those communities were telling them, please don't come here. We can take care of our own programs. We can take care of our own communities in certain ways. We can develop our own. The most successful self-help groups that have been created in India have been created by these women uh, whom we call as completely disempowered because they don't have access to uh, the kind of resources we have. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when we remain so disconnected between the empirical reality, the grounded reality, and 
the kind of uh, models we built for intervention, then I think we are we are creating further gaps in our studies. A very pertinent question was asked by Dr. Sandhu. Is there no feminist history before we, all those uh, moments we've started talking about? There, there is, there is immense amount of body of text written on the subject. Whether you want to look for it both ways, either uh, you know pushing women further into the margins or giving them a space uh, in whether you talk about the freedom movement, you talk about the Adivasi movement. Yesterday reference was made uh, to Durgavati who herself was symbolic of uh, having led many battles and having reigned queens. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag uh, when it comes to talking about these very, very complex issues. They're, they're not to be reduced or to be subjugated or to be brought into this kind of uh, uh, realm, you know, where the policy and the truth is the difference in it. Uh, I, uh, ek, bahut, these days, uh, I've been involved with disability research. Disability research may a very important sawal jo jisko main bar bar uh, samajhne ki koshish karne. When it comes to women, then we have all these rescue programs, you know, where these women who are uh, uh, mentally challenged, quote unquote, intellectually disabled, uh, have to be brought to rescue homes. And I have never really come across a study where uh, men are to be rescued and brought to these rescue homes. So it's a it's a very disjointed kind of a scenario that we built that women need those protection, though when they're brought to these shelter homes, most of them get exploited, they are, uh, you know, subject to sexual abuse. Uh, so whether it is family or it is these rescue homes, it's the same kind of treatment meted out uh, to her in those uh, all those domains, to which the previous speaker had referred to that how uh, when they were uh, when they are being exploited by their biological fathers, which happened very recently in Chandigarh, uh, that a mother had to complain because the father of the child insisted on bathing a four-year-old girl child, and he was abusing her, and she was in no position to complain. So those are the realities, the very very complex realities. But my concern here is because. I want to refer to what happens uh, when we plan strategies and take them to areas uh, where these are really not implemented. So when you start, um, let me uh, refer back to this entire discourse of human rights. I recently uh, published paper on uh, cultural rights and human rights and I must share this with you that when this uh, thing about human rights was being planned, uh, the uh, American Anthropological Association rejected the proposal. They said there can't be really anything called the discourse of universal human rights because cultural rights remain supreme. So the cultural rights of the communities, now unless you study cultural rights of those communities, how do you intervene in those projects? because you are not even aware of what the cultural realities of those areas are. So you prepare again, you plan them in silos, and then you try and implement them in those silos, uh, which I think is hugely problematic. Let me also revert back to, since I thought uh, it was located in the context of Adivasi women and Adivasi uh, reconstruction of those areas. When we were looking at them, this whole model, you know, I, I she referred to, uh, I, I would just take back to a very recently uh, released movie called Shady, which shows a, a woman forest guard 
a role played by Vidya Balan, how she tries to balance the rights and the livelihood of the Adivasi communities and those of the uh, those of saving the tiger, the project tiger. Now, like publications, which if they are published in foreign journals, they suddenly acquire value. If they're published in local language journals, they're, they are, they're just not important. Uh, when it comes to uh, giving these, uh, having these policy interventions, and I again want to take you back to 89, 90 when I was working in Mandla. We had International Union for Conservation of uh, you know, IUCN and the WWF, which were planning to protect tiger. Now, when you're trying to protect tiger, you throw the uh, Adivasis out because you can't let people live in the core area since they are, there is this animal uh, human conflict. Now, it's a model which came from outside India where people had never really lived in jungle with the animals. Whereas as far as our ancient culture and tradition goes, people have always lived in jungles with animals. Um, and there is a kind of a synergy between them. So when this woman officer tries to, because there is a mandate, you get money for doing that. And when this woman officer tries to protect the livelihood of the people, uh, then uh, they, there are problems, there are conflicts, there is uh, all kind of, uh, you know, uh, efforts are made to uh, remove her from that posting. So this is a story that happens in those areas in and out. Similarly, when we talk about gender here, I want to take you back after Nibya when we were revising the rape laws and how some of our women's studies departments, and I do remember that uh, Pam Rajput was chairing that meeting where they asked for interventions from uh, some of us. And it was very, very you know, assertive because I'd been working on HIV AIDS and, and uh, I, a passing reference was made by Budulji about how boys are exploited. So when it came to uh, the question of subjugation of males, the boys were far more, uh, you know, they were exploited by policemen in local gardens and all other kinds of places. So when I insisted that the rape laws should be gender neutral. And now women's studies uh, or departments were so assertive that no, this way the women's rights are going to be marginalized. My intention of saying all this is here, that look, unless we try and develop, hypothetically we refer to these holistic models, hypothetically, we talk about uh, doing, but we don't even exchange notes with other disciplines. So most of the planning, which starts from the top, invariably constructed by economists in those positions. And I always remember what uh, um, one of the eminent sociologists, anthropologists, Professor S.E. Dube once said, good economics could be bad sociology. So when you plan those strategies at the top and then you try and push them into local communities which live with very, very different uh, cultural models, then they are not, not going to work in sync with each other. Similarly, when you are doing these studies without taking uh, cognizance of various cultural variations, you know, our reference is always made to Northeast to matrilineal. You know how subjugated women are in that society. Unless you do some kind of empirical studies to go there and to understand those positions, it's just not going to be possible for us to uh, know what is happening in those communities or what is happening in those societies. So can you possibly have uh, my question to all of you, to young researchers, you know, people like me have spent years doing, talking, writing. Uh, it's your time. Now, unless you go to the field, unless you collect empirical data, 
unless you interact with those populations and know from them as to how they perceive interventions that you think are very positive because it takes you back to the positivist approach of science where you can sit back in your rooms and plan models and think that those models are going to be applicable universally across the board. That's what various commissions um, sitting across the board on different fields try and do that. Unless you are, have awareness, idea as to what are the different cultural values. So is it possible for us to talk about hundreds of diverse ethnic, religious, cultural communities uh, with a single theoretical model? How do you fit it? You know, it's as simple as saying one size doesn't fit all. So if it doesn't fit all, then why should we have one policy intervention? Why can't it be pluralistic? We don't seem to be talking in that language. We don't seem to be intervening in that language. And as researchers, if we don't do that, then are we really helping in the discourse? You know, what section of uh, population are we talking about? The issues that we have just debated for, for about an hour and a half earlier was so exclusively concentrated on a section of the women who are articulate, who are able to voice their concerns, who are able to come to these platforms and plan. But what happens to, nine, to roughly about 80% of your population who are experiencing discrimination, marginalization, constant persecution, uh, because we don't even seem to know what they're thinking and what they're doing. So unless you plan, unless there are various models of doing research and looking at empirical realities, unless various disciplines decide to come together, how do you go about it? Do we have any autoethnographies from Adivasi communities? You know, I just made a mention yesterday when I was trying to scribble something about it. Um, I almost thought I was going to be very angry. And I picked it up from um, a word that I saw, I, a sentence, a metaphor that I came across in disability literature, that it is a very angry literature. So if I want to be, uh, for the simple reason that the Adivasi voices are not heard, the texts written about them are not read, and you plan policies and you do interventions thinking that the same kind of models are going to apply to all of them. How many of us have actually really tried to see uh, what is happening to different sections of the society? We are worried that we don't have our so-called domestic helps coming home. So our burden has increased. But is the domestic help getting food to eat? What is it that she is doing to survive? We, we've not bothered to look at those areas or domains. Have we taken it as a moral responsibility to go and support them? Similarly, when we planned all our, for, you know, all our bio laws to protect the forest. So what happens to 8.6% of our population, which inhabits those lands? What is the kind of livelihood? How are they going to have this livelihood? You know, the studies that we've been doing on um, the, you know, whether uh, protection of nature or uh, conservation, is it a livelihood issue or is it a luxury issue? So who were, the, who were the exploiters? The exploiters were those who used those resources for generating their own uh, comfort zones. You know, that the, everything in nature was for, man, for human consumption. A very interesting point that I wish to, and those of you who are doing gender studies very, very seriously. We continue to use the metaphor of man Linguistically, we've not changed. We, we've not brought in the notion of human.
statements into our writings. You know, it's a study of uh, uh, it's a study of uh, for everything you say, uh, man-made. It's not uh, we've not even replaced the word by human-made. So much so that my own discipline, anthropology, uh, they continue to call it a study of man and not study of humans. So they, they, there are those basic premises where you do this kind of a gender segregation. Then there are communities which did, do not have the similar kind of experiences that we have in urban middle classes. Then as researchers, we try and impose those models on them uh, because we think it is going to be for their benefit. Uh, again, let me share one more story with you. And I think uh, I'll be much happier talking to you, having a dialogue with you, uh, than really going on into this kind of a monologue with you. Uh, for the simple reason that uh, uh, unless you do that, the stories which are there uh, from the grounded reality do not come up. We had this massive satellite program and uh, this is a reference I'm again taking you back to early 90s. A satellite program where we set up these, uh, uh, you know, television sets in uh, all community centers, the Panchayati, under the Panchayati Raj model, where these developments had to be carried out. And over there, there were lots of advertisements about dowry that how women are being, uh, you know, burned because of, for the demand of dowry and all those things. Now, this populations that I work with, the beggars, uh, the gone, the Adivasi populations were there. Uh, there was, as I said, was a question of right price. And there were two kinds of villages that we normally, when we go to these uh, Adivasi bears, we divide them. There are uh, the villages which are by the side of the road, and then there are villages which are inside. And those villages, villages which were located uh, near the road, uh, a boy happened to become a graduate. So next time when I, we went back to the field, it seemed that that boy was asking for dowry. He wanted a bicycle from the girl's side, whereas earlier the practice was that he had to pay to get a bride. Now, this is where this uh, kind of interference, you know, when you carry forward messages uh, which you think are going to change the communities, uh, adverse changes comes. Another uh, uh, very, very, you know, striking uh, feature that I remember till date was you know, tattoo has become very, very fashionable now. So these uh, television anchor, one of the television anchors called Salma Sultan used to wear a huge bindi. Now all these Adivasi communities have a tradition of tattooing. Next time when I went back to that community, I found that these women who were earning six rupees a day were spending 50 pesa on a packet of bindi. Uh, they have tattoos because the god and the beggar women were to be distinguished by the kind of tattoo they had on their bodies. But now because uh, they saw these, uh, this lady wearing a huge bindi, they wanted to buy those plastic bindis. But something that I am very passionately pursuing lately is that uh, you, we've, we've deprived them. Now tattoo is very fashionable. <clears throat> And most of the tattoo designs are borrowed from most of the Adivasi communities across the world, not only from India, but from Africa and other parts of the world too. Have we ever gone back to give any kind of patent to them? Sadly, no. We don't even recognize that these designs came from them. For your gender discourse, the Madhubani paintings, we all probably bought one for ourselves. Did we really bother to find out that the Madhubani designs are patented? No. We talk about this entire pharmacopoeia. The most popular, uh, I think the product in the market today is ashwagandha. Do you know even this source? 
Ashwagandha came from the Kani Adivasis. By, by an accidental discovery, there were two researchers from Jammu uh, who had gone to Kerala and were studying uh, the botanical gardens over there and they were walking with these uh, two indigenous people from there, the Kani Adivasis who weren't getting tired, but they were getting tired. They found that these uh, Kani Adivasis were plucking some leaves and eating them regularly. Now those were the Ashwagandha leaves. So they came back, they made a compound and uh, then they were being very benevolent. They wanted to give some benefits to these Adivasi communities, uh, but the model collapsed. Now, the whole world is buying ashwagandha, but the Adivasis, the source, the original natural source where uh, uh, ash these leaves were actually grown is virtually disappearing. And they have been reduced to paupers. So has anybody thought of giving them their cultural right and patent on it? If we had given them a patent on it, they would have been billionaires today. We talk about, again, reverting back to Manila and I refer to Vegas. You know, the 85% uh, of world's pharmacopoeia is based on indigenous knowledge systems. And these indigenous knowledge systems have been so rich that they borrowed this knowledge from them. And today we want them to revert to the contemporary models of the kind of medication we want to provide for them. It's a, but just, you know, something that I've been very passionately working on and want you people also to do. And most of this work, please, let me tell you this. The collections and uh, these are done by Adivasi communities, by women, not by men alone. So they, they are equal partners. Uh, the questions of gender violence that you see here doesn't really happen in most of the communities that I have had the occasion to study with, uh, which is sort of across the, across the country uh, for almost about 30 odd years. And now, uh, you know, is just this one little paragraph that I want to read out. There are 2.7 lakh plant-specific biodiversity species across the world, of which 900 are used for human food, clothing, medicinal, etc. purposes. 90% of these species are restricted only to 10% of Earth's landmass, and most of it belongs to India. And uh, 17 countries occupy this region of equator where uh, this is... Um, produced and, uh, you know, harbored, uh, but for centuries you've exploited this knowledge without acknowledging the right for them to have patents on it, the right for them to have some kind of share. The only little effort we make, and I, I probably the last story I want to take you back with them, somewhere, you know, probably losing the track of what I want to say and talk about. Uh, way back in 1989, when we were pushing uh, these people out of uh, their territories, their habitats, for conserving tiger, because the tigers were dying. So we said we are putting them at the periphery of uh, forests and uh, uh, we are settling them in certain villages. So we built a village called Indra Vangram and we showcased that village in various international conferences and I happened to see that uh, uh, documentary in Zagreb in 1988. So when I went to Manila, I wanted to look for the Indra Vangram. Would you believe it? The Indra Van Gram did not even exist in the census. So you had pushed the village out of the forest. So it was no longer a forest village. It was put in the between the core area of the forest and the borders. And it was no longer a revenue village. 
So nobody really owned it and it was not recorded in the census. And they had no drinking water. They had no access to food. Uh, they were jaundiced, but we did nothing. We showcased it as the model village we built. So when we do these kind of uh, interventions and claim that our tiger population has multiplied so many times, do we realize that in the process all over the country, whatever industrialization we've done, uh, wherever we worked, we have displaced Adivasis. 88% Adivasis have been displaced for our industrialization projects. Today we sit here and talk about policies for a handful of uh, gendered population in our cities, not knowing what happened to those women who enjoyed equal rights, equal rights in the ownership of land, in mining, in whatever efforts they were making to stay alive, livelihood and common resources. They are the most sexually exploited women across the country today. They live in the, you know, in a situation uh, that we are not even willing to accept to buy that that is, uh, you know, you're constantly being told there is no research being done, but the research which is being done is not even looked at. Now I speak to you only on behalf of those women, those who do not have their voices to come here, to come to these platforms and share what they're going to be, what they're going through, what is happening to them. On their behalf, I press to those of you who are working on women issues, please move out of middle class urban areas, really to understand the kind of subjugation, the kind of marginalization that the women coming from SC and ST communities are experiencing. The Dalit voices have been able to find some kind of a platform, but the Adivasi women have not been able to find a platform to talk about the exploitation, the marginalization that they've been experiencing for decades together. They did it prior to the independence of the country. Post-independence, the model has remained uh, what it was, the colonial model, because we use colonial categories, we use colonial terminologies. And I want to wind up by reading here something written by one of those who had experienced this kind of marginalization, uh, excerpt from a poem which says, The Bridge. I feel calm, then I stagger and stumble I want to be graceful, but I meet someone new. I feel shy, my muscles start jerking, and I stutter. I need harmony between inner me and outer me. People see the outer me off balance, out of kilter and truly. Ah, but I'm learning to confront my rage and despair, and I feel uh, I may have friends who may support me. Please do become friends of these communities. Gender studies have to go beyond these boundaries that we have created for ourselves. Thank you so much. Sorry, um, I think the, I didn't remain focused. I haven't read out a word of what I had written. Uh, there were certain questions which had come up and I thought, let me draw your attention to an area that probably many of you haven't really even bothered to think about so far. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. In fact, you related it so very beautifully with the stories so that it was easier for us to grasp the whole thing. Thank you so much for such an interesting, stimulating lecture. Uh, it surely charged our neurons. Believe me. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, now, if you allow, can we have a couple of questions, please? Please, as many as they are. Thank you so much. The first one is by Rosalind, our dear Canadian sister, and uh, she says, of course, she's very appreciative of the lecture. And she says, what kind of challenges do you face in empirical research in these areas then and now? Has there been any change? 
in the kind of challenges that you face? Uh, you know, Arshlin, uh, yesterday when I decided to listen to what Palani was saying, I uh, thought I probably things would have changed after about uh, 35 years. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sad to share that nothing has changed. In fact, things have gone much worse. Uh, reaching out to these populations, uh, you know, a word that Pallavi constantly used yesterday, uh, they were shy. When I started going to these areas uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s, they were not shy. They danced, they sang, then we had these festival of India models. So we put them in cages. We dressed them in very kind of synchronic costumes. It was a favorite project of uh, Ma'am Pukul Jekar at that time. We took them all over the world, kept them locked inside the rooms, never gave them food that they wanted to eat. And we pushed them into a corner that now when you go back, and I must share this with you, that I went back to Amakantak University, which is supposedly uh, India's first and the largest tribal university. And they put up a cultural program for the participants. Now, instead of dancing to that kind of music that they cherished, which was theirs, they were all dancing to Bollywood tunes. So if you think that coming to the colleges and universities helped them retain their cultural values and uh, synergy with their environment, sadly, no. So what has changed has gone from, I, I, I'm not really an isolationist, you know, I'm not talking in terms of models by which you can put them or preserve them as museum specimens. So the challenge at that time, when I went from Jamalpur to Mandala in 88 with about 30 of my students, of whom majority were girls, and they said, don't go to Adivasi areas, you know, they will, uh, uh, they do, uh, they are witches and there are all kinds of those uh, labeling was done. Nothing like that happened, you know, we had, we were able to establish repo with them. We were go, able to go inside their territories. Today, we brought them out of those territories. And we put them on those permanent kind of huts, but they're neither connected to this part of the culture nor to the other side of it. So they're hanging somewhere in between. So what do you do with these, uh, you know, as a researcher, if you think, what are the kind of challenges we are facing? Uh, approaching administrators is becoming next to impossible now. We, the researcher and the planner work in silos. They have absolutely no interaction or communication. Way back in 88, you know, I could bring the collector and the conservator together. I could take members of the planning commission with us to those seminars that we held in these Adivasi areas. Do you think it is possible today? We talk about, you know, we, we don't even have those models of connect with us anymore. We just dismiss. And somehow we are now so obsessed with these Western models, uh, these notions of Western, whether it is system of medicine, you know, the, the, there is a very powerful indigenous system of medicine. These women in 70s and 80s were able to space their families. Did we bother to find out how they did it? No. You know, yesterday so much of focus was being uh, put on uh, these, uh, the, uh, what was this uh, supposed to be? Sickle cell anemia. Now the study says that Adivasis uh, is between one to 40%, that several Adivasi populations, because it is a homozygotic, uh, you know, it's, it's something which is linked to your chromosomes, a gene specific uh, disorder. 
and most of these communities were spills endogamous so obviously the transmission the possibility of transmission was much more but all over the world whatever studies have been done they are saying that the symptoms that they experience are much much less than what an urban person or people in other parts of the world experience so what is it have they been using some kind of indigenous medicines have they been using some kind of uh, uh, you know are they climate or their habitat where they lived now you uproot them you bring them out from their habitats you uh, want to change you want to tell them this is not good a very uh, you know when i laughed when the first interventions we started doing most big government did not wear an upper cloth and as an intervention we started distributing sewing machines so we gave them a complex that you have to cover up a part of your body and you have to stitch when you have never worn stitch clothes so somewhere without studying without knowing what those practices are uh, we are introducing interventions uh, which simply do not help and i'm i'm saying this and addressing because uh from the perspective of gender studies you know it was such a brilliant presentation that we will make but not a word not a word about these sections of the society so what is the what is our percentage of the population these are we deaths you know we talk about distribution free ration today to more than 80% of indians do we fall in that category No. So where is our theory going? Whether you want to talk about masculinity or you want to spend, I've spent. I've been writing about women's issues since '76. But the question is that when are we going to come out of those theoretical frameworks? When are we going to start into a grounded theory? About building a theory is from where what they tell us but if you don't even go there then how do you write about it how do you evolve a model for intervention and that's where you know i feel very sad at the fact end of my career that at least our generation some of us were forced to do that you know or we desired i i wouldn't say that i went there willingly but once i went there i realized that uh, there was no going back you know so some of our young researchers are willing to do that go to a slum area go to talk about adivasi area and actually talk to those women and find out what are the models they want rather than saying okay this is what is happening this is all right this is, this is the dominant discourse to which we are all you know aware party to but there is another discourse so when will when are we going to look at that So for a researcher, I think your challenge is come out of your room, come out of your comfort zone, just go and get your hands dirty. Yeah, there's no other. I hope I answered you. No, no shortcut to success. No there, there, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. And another question, somewhat related to it, by Moitri Day. She says, as a researcher, do you think we need specific research tools? Which are more uh, South Asia, which are more from South Asia perspective. Uh, the research tools uh, is, you know, uh, the first thing that I have told my students all my life is this: just don't do any reading, which you will find so contrary to the standard practice of doing research. Please just go to the field, and then come back and tell me. you know there was a time when uh, learning a language was mandatory before you go to the field now it's not that you can't do secondary data research but if you're going to do primary data research then everybody every researcher across the globe is reverting to what they call as the grounded theory now the grounded theory says uh you bring your theoretical models from the ground from what people tell you you know to since i'm sharing 
to or is I'll tell you since it is in the context of women's studies. When we brought these changes in um, well, customary laws of inheritance and we said women are bound to have a share in the property. So we have this entire uh, dominant debate, you know, that there's something called honor killing. We, you know, as a group of, international group of uh, women researchers, we said, we don't want to call it honor killing, it's dishonor killing. But you know, when we went to the field and did a study, what we found that majority of these women who were killed, were killed by their families for land. The brothers wanted exclusive right on the land. So it was not, it had nothing to do with family's honor. It had nothing to do with marrying within the Gotra. It had all to do with land. So when you bring about these kind of reforms, uh, you do not realize that what is happening on the ground. So these dishonor killings, as uh, we've started calling them, were happening because of property, not happening because of the uh, established models. Uh, something very interesting that will probably strike to a middle class mentality. I've been talking to some friends in some of the premier medical institutes here. After paternity, uh, maternity leave was increased. You know, those in position of power in these institutions said, you know, we're thinking twice about hiring women doctors. So you have a positive intervention. You extend maternity leave, but see what is happening. At some of your premier medical institutions, those in position of power are saying, you know, we are now thinking twice about hiring women doctors. Because if they go on such long leaves and then we will not get permission to hire another doctor, I don't know whether any of you have ever faced this, but as a member of selection committee, I once faced this. They, they, you know, we did everything right. There was an objective assessment. There were seven members on the board. Um, and ultimately, the vice chancellor was a very, very neutral kind of a person who wasn't sharing. He put all the scores together. And there was this young tribal girl who got selected. So the experts, I happened to be only a woman on the panel because... Um, then they had made it mandatory that at least there has to be a woman expert on the panel. These colleagues said, we can't hire her. You know, anthropology is a field science and she's married, she's going to become pregnant and she will not go to the field. So what is it that you are trying to establish here and I put my foot down and I says, look, record my dissent if you're going to go against it. And fortunately, the vice chancellor stood by. And today, she is one of the most promising and brilliant uh, women colleague we have. So it's like here, uh, the, the, the entire space somehow. On the one hand, you talk about communities who are, which are not being researched at all, about which nobody is talking. On the other hand, you see within uh, your own social domain as to what has been happening and lots of those positive uh, interventions that we've been making, uh, the kind of impact it is having on the society. So I'm sure if one of you takes up the study that after changes in customary law were made or after uh, something as simple as extending the leave granted to women, maternity leave granted to women, uh, how the percentage of uh, women in professions uh, has actually come down. So it's going to be probably the results are going to be shocking uh, that I can possibly see using these. But move over to qualitative methods of research. Your quantitative methods of research do not serve any purpose. Numbers don't matter at all. Numbers don't lead you anywhere. And you're seeing what is happening across us. Uh, so please, 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 my earnest request to most of you, unless you collect narratives, unless you collect stories from the ground and feel confident enough to write about it in your writings, don't worry about rejection of papers. International publications are today primarily based on your writings. So, of narratives. 
which give you so much to thought for and take cognizance of your reflexivity, of your prejudices, of your biases. Thank you. Narendra okay. uh, Sangha, ma'am, wants to ask the question. No, it's answered, Kiran. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Ma'am, so ma'am, ma before vote of thanks, uh, Madam Rajeshwari Rana Jodi hui hai. Unko ek baar. So, uh, okay. और सभी से रिक्वेस्ट है अपने कैमरे ऑन कर लें अब एक फोटो सेशन हमें करना है तब तक आप सब जब तक आई जस्ट आई वुड फॉलो द क्वेश्चन बट समथिंग व्हिच गोस आउट ऑफ माय क्यूरियोसिटी एंड अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ एंथुसियाज्म दैट आई हैड सो यू वर इंस्ट्रूमेंटल इन इंट्रोड्यूसिंग न्यू कोर्सेज जस्ट वांटेड टू आस्क इफ इट इज पॉसिबल फॉर पीपल लाइक मी टू डू दोस कोर्सेज वन बाय वन and get credited for it with courses like anthropology management or medical anthropology or psychological anthropology can we do it you should actually do it because uh, that is what uh, now the norm is that everything you know there are interdisciplinary programs running over there uh, let me uh, share this with you that it's not going to be easy Yeah, because it's not going to be easy because the orientations are so different. Uh, but then once you infuse them, you know my experience uh, with uh, doing these qualitative method programs with the students from all over law, management, uh, sciences for that matter, and uh, it's such a pleasure when they come back and tell you, you know, we are going to revisit our data. so if you're going to revisit your data it's only when you have an exposure to other you know, so if you do a course on psychological anthropology or since you're teaching english you know cultural studies is actually nothing but they they just uh, started uh, calling anthropology as cultural studies so there is that american and british divide and uh, you know some of our best anthropologists today Uh, like somebody like uh, um, Arjuna Padurai, you know, they they are the hot favorites with cultural studies departments. But what is it that they're talking about? They're essentially talking about their own. They they're relocating themselves when they're moving from India to other parts of the world, and how uh, those experiences matter. So if you do a course on linguistic anthropology, or you do a course on psychological anthropology. i think it will add so much value to analysis media and anthropology the previous speaker had been you know, focusing so much on it uh, which is nothing but it was an anthropological discourse you know ethnographic film making for instance i think most departments should take up film making because that's one exercise which is going to be very exciting for young students and also it's something which is going to add a lot of value uh, to learning so now that we are all being forced to come to i this was not my platform uh, i feel so energetic when i'm standing in a classroom and looking at your eyes and expressions which is like looking at a blank screen today so if you do some of these programs i think um, it's probably going to add uh, immense value to those courses go ahead and do it introduce and just out of the box thank you so much and uh, i take this opportunity now to invite professor rana professor rajeshwari rana from wtc rani dwapati university to say a few words professor rajeshwari rana मैम माइक अनम्यूट कर लीजिए मैम माइक अनम्यूट सर थैंक यू सो मच गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबॉडी फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक प्रिंसिपल माता सुंदरी कॉलेज डॉक्टर हरप्रीत कौर मैम फॉर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग सच वंडरफुल टू डेज वर्कशॉप ऑन रीसेंट ट्रेंड्स इन रिसर्च वुमेन स्टडीज so as uh, i have gone through all discussion and uh, found that our aim for women studies is uh, very clear that we have to empower our women which are the pillars of the society 
and we are committed for that to achieve that mission we have to create lot of awareness about uh, their potential about their developing self confidence self esteem and various other employment opportunity for them first of all all women study center uh, like uh, in universities we have women study center but in colleges we are having only women development cell so i feel it is very important that we must start uh, or we must open this uh, department sorry uh, we must open uh, women studies department in uh, all the colleges to promote this interdisciplinary subject so that uh, uh, we can achieve we can really achieve a gender inclusive society so this is my very humble request to principal dr harpreet kaur ma'am that you must start a women study center because from the ugc also we are not getting uh, much grant so i think uh, in self financing mode all the universities and all the colleges they can initiate this interdisciplinary subject because it is a very interesting subject and uh, we cannot imagine our country without the participation of the 50% of population so here we have to do lot of capacity building courses for our women participants for our girls also so that uh, and we have to conduct various research training programs also for empowering them so this is very important the, that we must have women study center in colleges in the universities and also day care centers because that is also very important uh, when it comes uh, regarding uh, women leaving their children it is very important that we must have day care center also in the universities and colleges some of the universities are having in the north but not in the madhya pradesh and tribal region here we have started in jabalpur and our day care center is functioning very well we have started this day care center in number of uh, family welfare organization of army also uh, where uh, lot of uh, army officers wife our jawans wife they are leaving their children and they are coming for vocational uh, courses because uh, the when uh, ugc has introduced community colleges scheme and uh, vocational scheme we walk uh, schemes so number of uh, women are interested for doing certificate diploma and post graduate diploma courses so i think we can encourage lot of uh, uh, our students those who are sitting at home and not very keen and with this uh, present digital platform online platform i think number of participants we can increase on this side so this is my uh, this is my strategy how to how to like uh, we must uh, target our group which are uh, totally unaware on this issues because when we started women studies center here they said oh women are already in power why do you need this center even in the university but when we have started working on it when we have discussing various problems on it then we realized it is very very important subject and uh, regarding this uh, if we have to build a new knowledge in the national and in the global perspectives i think we have to work a lot on this issue we have to really uh, develop a curriculum which can start right from the certificate program then diploma program post graduate diploma programs and then leads to a degree program that should be our initiative regarding this and we have to definitely build a conducive environment for our women uh, as uh, dr pallavi was also saying um, some of our uh, like uh, top senior officers also facing uh, same problems because uh, availability of toilets are not there then environment is not there so we have to build that conducive environment for our women also and uh, if we will do that definitely we can uh, talk about their uh, economic uh, progress also because uh, without their economic contribution because no society can be a smart so, uh, society until and unless uh, uh, they have a contribution from their women counterpart so it is very important uh, that we must encourage for the, so that they should come on this uh, uh, they must participate in this economic uh, platform and uh, side by side we have to promote science and technology also because uh, i have seen uh, there is lot of scope for women for girls student in science and technology also so where uh, like um, uh, they can uh, produce number of uh, we are doing here mushroom cultivation and post harvest technology which is very very popular amongst uh, because uh, it uh, requires uh, 
very uh, small uh, investment and uh, like uh, children those who are suffering from malnutrition or our ladies which are suffering from malnutrition and those who are all on vegetarian diets for them this uh, this is a very good source so we are working on that mushroom cultivation and post harvest technology so likewise we are working on renewable energy also we are running some diploma programs in renewable energy so we are uh, i have uh, like a uh, got uh, more women in uh, that and they are into learning all this key how to save energy and how to uh, produce this uh, panels also because uh, some of the industries and factories are nearby in this uh, madhya pradesh area and we have got a biggest uh, solar plant in riva so this is also one aspect where we are working so with this i think uh, we can uh, definitely uh, go to the grassroots levels and uh, we can uh, invite women and uh, ladies uh, especially for participation so and they can uh, do some good courses regarding in this i think uh, women studies has to go into lot of extension activities uh, research is one thing and uh, regarding our extension program also we have to uh, um, i must say to dr harpreet ma'am that ma'am must start some Uh, good courses on personality development on the finishing school pattern because we have to save our marriage institution also and we have to save on marital discords also because uh, these days so many marital discords so we are here this personality development program should uh, build uh, in built like it should work almost like on the pattern of uh, uh, finishing school patterns where girls learn so many things and it is important because being the warden of the the suba girls hostel here in rani durgavati i have realized our girls are from very very primitive areas tribal belt and they are really uh, sometimes i feel they are innocent but sometimes i find them very smart also but at the same time there is a great need of organizing various personality development program those who are in delhi and uh, like capital cities uh, for their girls uh, this uh, this is not the requirement but in uh, small places like maharashtra uh, villages madhya pradesh villages even in haryana villages and uh, punjab also i will say because i have taught in gurdaspur also i was in mukeria also so there also i have seen uh, this is very important aspect we, which we normally uh, ignore uh, regarding we leave this uh, like it is uh, we don't consider it much and uh, we have to encourage uh, like uh, self help groups because as present pa pandemic going on so i found that uh, these groups are really very nice they are uh, working together and our ladies uh, they are getting good uh, uh, returns also they are getting good uh, like they are they have started so many things from home and uh, they are finding it very important for girls uh, i think uh, for the girls and for the gender inclusive society it is important that we must have uh, legal literacy programs also then we must have computer literacy program for them also so these are some issues where a lot of scope is there and uh, with that i would like to thank uh, dr harpreet ma'am mata sundari college all the team professors of mata sundari college and all our distinguished resource person uh, right from dr palvi ma'am to all our uh, esteemed professors of various colleges those who have joined in this uh, two days program research program a uh, seminar so from the bottom of my heart i would like to thank each and every one for their contribution for their uh, immense uh, like uh, they th throw a lot of focus on enlightenment regarding all these issues so i i am really thankful to each and every participants students also those who have joined and uh, from rani durgavati vishwavidyalay mahila adhyan kend and from uh, delhi university i really extend my heartfelt thanks to all the a resource person all the participants thank you so much thank you professor rana thank you so much and thank you for your valuable suggestions and various strategies on how to empower women by providing them with legal literacy and computer literacy and opening up child care centers and all those things and uh, having personality development courses thank you so much for these strategies to empower women thank you for your kind Thank you. Thank you. May I now invite our principal, Professor Dr. Harpreet Kaur, to propose a vote of thanks. Professor Harpreet Kaur, please. Yes. Yeah.
Uh, th thank you, Dr. Karanjit Sethi. Uh, the two days have been really very enlightening. Uh, it has been very interesting and so many intriguing questions have been raised also. And uh, first of all, I really want to thank uh, um, um, Dr. Rana, basically, because uh, Women's Studies Research Center, Rani Durgavati Vishwavadale Jabalpur and Matasundri College have collaborated together and they have come together for this kind of an event where we are talking about women uh, issues and women's studies, basically. And she has given a very good suggestion about the Women's Study Centers, uh, focusing on the research and advocacy and institution engaged and committed to women rights uh, yes of course but of co uh, maybe the university does not give us so much uh, flexibility yes but we can make a humble move uh, regarding the daycare center she uh, suggested uh, we are already doing uh, something about it because many times i see even our students are coming with young babies and uh, when they are giving exam the children are standing outside so that was my focus, but due to COVID, somehow uh, the things could not, uh, we could not complete because many of the faculty members have young babies. And so that kind of a uh, thing which will empower them and uh, because uh, they have constraints at home. And so that is my focus, of course. And, uh, and again, one very interesting issue she raised about the divorce, which is going on. And I, and I believe that uh, I understand that uh, where today the advocates are really busy with two issues. One is the property issue and the second is the divorce issues. So these kind of things are going on in the society. And we at this kind of uh, gathering where we came together and we discussed about women issues. Uh, here we wanted that, you, that women issues should be taken up in a holistic manner. In a holistic manner, which is more re reflective also, uh, which is uh, actually empowering the women for critical thinking. And uh, two institutions both named after women who have been leaders, mighty leaders in their own times. If we see uh, uh, Mata Sundariji, she led uh, the Sikh, uh, Sikhs for 40 years. And uh, so we want to inculcate and instill that same ethos uh, in the young women. And with this kind of a feeling, both the institutions are working. And so such an event, uh, of course, will really enlighten our students also and all the people who have participated in it. Uh, and the best thing, personally, I believe of this uh, particular gathering was two research uh, uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Pallavi Jan Govil and Prof. Shalini Mehta, and both of them uh, so related to the uh, whole epoch and the whole uh, thinking. And you see that both of them have, are so concerned about Madhya Pradesh and they have worked there also. Uh, with their personal experiences, they have related so many things. I think that is the best takeaway that we could understand that their commitment to the cause and with their commitment to the cause, how, could, how they made changes uh, at the grassroots levels. And so that is, I think, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Pallavi Jain Govil, uh, her own, uh, she also shared that how she has sudden constraint while working. She wanted to do many more things, but of course uh, there were constraints while uh, implementing. And uh, so, so uh, she is more passionate about it and she is working in the same field. And uh, she also discussed about the research area, the disruptive research and the disruptive questions which come forward uh, before the institutions and organizations uh, and the groups and how to solve them. Uh, so with these kind of dedicated people uh, and implementers, policy implementers, I think I see a ray of hope that uh, things will of course improve because they are so passionately uh, dedicated to the cause of whether it is livelihood mission, whether it is a sickle cell anemia issue or other issues, with their personal dedication, they are working. So that is, I think, wonderful. In, in the same vein, I can already uh, also talk about uh, Professor Mehta also, how Professor Mehta is so passionate about her work, her own per personal experiences. And she very rightly pointed out that the research is there in the international journals. And uh, so somehow the gap between the academia and those policy makers and implementers stay for long. And so that is why this kind of gap is there. And so we have to come out of this segregated regime and uh, bring about some kind of a 
uh, togetherness so that they are both, uh, you know, was treading together and both are trying to solve the problems of the grassroots. Uh, they both have worked at uh, the grassroots level, uh, the Adivasi women and their issues, which are totally different. And uh, we, uh, despite, you know, uh, progression and despite education, I think it is important that they are close to their culture also. And so that balance, striking that balance is very difficult. Uh, and yet they should be guided that you sh if you are educated, you are forgetting and you about and talking about those uh, and dancing on the Bollywood, uh, you know, the music and all. And but that indigenous indigenous music that is so uh, um, it's beautiful that we are forgetting. And uh, she rightly pointed out, I think, the self help groups, uh, which is really ushering in a silent revolution, and women are being empowered whether it is the social revolution or the economic revolution. Uh, basically, I believe it is the economic uh, independence which the women is getting, which is making them more uh, socially uh, responsible also and socially comfortable also, uh, so much so that they are able to uh, question their own husbands if they are wrong, if they are coming home after drinking or spending uh, wrongly and so on. Uh, and this we have seen in uh, our neighbor, neighboring countries. Of course, this movement started with Bangladesh, uh, but uh, in Pakistan also I saw, because I went, uh, happened to go to Pakistan and I, I uh, talked about, uh, I uh, interacted with a woman who was heading one of the self-help groups. And she said, there's a lot of changes which is coming in. Despite the cultural kind of constraints there, this movement at the grassroots is changing and empowering and also educating women. And so these kind of grassroots movements will go a long way in tackling the issues which are there, uh, especially the economic issues, the social issues, uh, and, and so on. So uh, these are the practical suggestions, I think, given by both our speakers. Uh, then uh, uh, Mr. Satish Kumar Singh also, Senior Advisor, Center for Health and Social Justice. Uh, uh, I think his views were very interesting because he actually uh, talked uh, from a different perspective. And uh, his questioning about the problems of women equality, that why men? That questioning was very pertinent, that why men are not part of the solution, that why men are not going forward, because that empowerment has to come or in the men also, because uh, after all, they, that, that kind of, a, you know, that going on together, that how they are, uh, men and women are intricate part and they are, uh, you are balancing each other. So with these de women debate would be incomplete until unless that mindset of men also change. And that was very progressive about him that in, in these gender equality programs and all these, uh, all these you know, the, the things, the men should be at forefront. And uh, he very rightly pointed out and uh, that uh, suggestion or that point, uh, I think what said was very, very pertinent also that men are scared of empowered women because it will change their uh, superiority and that kind of a, uh, control they have over women. And that was, I think, the, these are the mindset problems which are there in the society, uh, which should be changed. And with these, I think women problems will be lessened. Then uh, we had Professor Kusumlata also uh, talking from a different perspective altogether, of course, the disability perspective uh, and especially the women perspective uh, into it. And she is uh, and she's rightly says uh, that, you know, of course, we when we talk about the outer changes, but they are not long, uh, long staying. What we have to do is that we have to make them empowered, that they have confidence in them. And that will start from the upbringing itself, the upbringing, the changes in the society, their education, uh, their uh, participation in the profession, professional space uh, and social space. So all these things which are deeply rooted in our society and in the mindset and psyche of the people, uh, we should come out of it. And uh, then, uh, and after all, then she also said that disability framework, whatever we talk within it, is also part of the human rights framework, so that equality should be given to all. Uh, and so the, these, uh, these are very interesting uh, things which we talked, and uh, uh, it was really interesting, and I really thank all the uh, speakers, uh, they, they spared their time, 
and uh, presented their views, really doing justice to it. And uh, we were really benefited, uh, especially if we're talking about myself and my all my colleagues. Uh, they were really very benefited uh, from their uh, insight into the concept and also the practice. And I think practice is by and large most important because theory, uh, we, we talk so many things in theory and theory, theory is also changing also. Uh, rights framework is uh, very apt if we see, but that implementation gap is still there despite all the rights the constitution provides us. And, uh, so, and with this, I also want to thank uh, uh, my team, uh, which has re really stayed through the entire, uh, uh, entire two days. They have really stayed through. They have worked very hard, uh, preparing each and everything, whether it is the certificates, whether it is the press release and everything, staying through and coordinating. And uh, so I really thank them. And uh, I'm looking forward with, uh, to more and more ki these kind of events. Uh, and so that we, uh, we are making a humble contribution to make our young women empowered. And uh, this is a very humble contribution, yes, but we want to change the mindset and a small beginning will make a change and we'll continue with these kind of uh, events. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for attending this two-day national मैम कुछ लोग बाहर से जुड़े हुए हैं जोधपुर से हैं डॉक्टर कीर्ति माहेश्वरी वो अपना कोई फीडबैक अगर देना चाहें तो रिकॉर्ड में ले कीर्ति जी अपना माइक ऑन कर लीजिए आपकी आवाज नहीं आ रही कीर्ति जी आ रही है सर हाँ जी नमस्कार आप सभी को लोकेश सर राजेश्वरी मैम और हरचीज मैम से तो मैं मिल चुकी थी पहले जब कोर्स किया था मैंने रिफ्रेशर कोर्स लेकिन बाकी सभी से मेरा पहली बार मिलना हुआ पल्लवी मैम को मैंने कल सुना आ, उसके बाद में सुकुमलता मैम को भी सुना था तो विकलांग विमत के बारे में मुझे भी जानकारी पहली बार ही मिली थी वो सुकुमलता मैम से कह रही थी कि सभी लोग जो सामान्य लोग हैं वो ध्यान नहीं देते हैं विकलांग विमत पर तो वो सही बात थी हम लोग ध्यान दे ही नहीं पाते हैं कई चीजों पर फिर उसके बाद में जो सिकलसेल एनीमिया अभी मशरूम कल्टीवेशन के बारे में जो बताया क्योंकि महिलाओं में आफ्टर प्रेगनेंसी या डिलीवरी के बाद में बहुत चीजों की कमी हो जाती है और वो इन सब चीजों को हम पूरी कर सकते हैं ये सारी चीजें बताई जो कल सर ने बताया था सुधीर सर ने मर्दानी वाली बात और चेयरमैन चेयरपर्सन वाली बात वो चीज मैंने आज भी देखी कई यूनिवर्सिटीज में लेटर पर ऊपर चेयरपर्सन लिखा है चेयरमैन नहीं लिखा था तो चीजें समाज में बदल रही है महिलाओं के प्रति और वो अच्छी चीज है एक सकारात्मक सोच है जहाँ पर वो ये कहते हैं कि पुरुष को भी महिला के साथ में इस ट्रेंड में चलना पड़ेगा पुरुष पीछे नहीं रह सकता वो भी जब साथ चलेगा तो ही समाज में बदलाव आ सकता है तो ये कुछ चीजें जो है जो मैंने दो दिन में सीखी है मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगा बस मैं ये चाहती हूँ लोकेशन की वर्कशॉप छह दिन हो जाती या सात दिन तो मजा ज्यादा आता हम लोग ज्यादा सीख पाते हैं अभी हमारे कुछ बड़े कार्यक्रम आएंगे आप वेट करो <laughs> <laughs> हम लोग तो बड़े कार्यक्रमों के लिए जाने जाते हैं वैसे भी <laughs> बदनाम है पंद्रह दिन वाले कोर्स में बहुत मजा आया था चलिए बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद धन्यवाद लवलीना व्यास जी हैं आई थिंक राजस्थान से ही हैं लवलीना व्यास जी लवलीना व्यास अर्चना पातकी जी आप बहुत सीनियर है सब और बहुत सारे सीनियर लोग जुड़े हुए हैं इस कार्यक्रम के साथ में स्टूडेंट्स के साथ साथ और टीचर्स काफी सारे जुड़े हुए हैं तो अगर आप कोई अपना रिव्यू देना विवेकानंद कॉलेज में पढ़ाती है स्वाति करें मैम बाइंड फीडबैक फॉर्म अभी लिंक काम नहीं कर रहे हम ग्रुप में शेयर कर देंगे और आपका सर्टिफिकेट हम, हमारी ओर से बनकर तैयार है लेकिन बहुत सारे लोग इस समय नहीं जुड़े हुए हैं वो यूट्यूब पर सुनेंगे हमारी हमने चाहा तो यही था कि हम सर्टिफिकेट फीडबैक के साथ अटैच कर रहे हैं लेकिन अभी क्योंकि 50-60 के आसपास ही लोग थे यहाँ पर और रजिस्ट्रेशन काफ़ी सारे लोगों का है और लोगों ने काफ़ी सारा यूट्यूब चैनल देखा भी है कल जो हम लोग देख रहे हैं तो कल शाम तक आपके सर्टिफिकेट पहुँच जाएंगे सबके पास हम हमारी कोशिश है कल शाम को सर्टिफिकेट तैयार है सिर्फ अटैच करना है हमें और कुछ नहीं करना सब कुछ तैयार है हमारी ओर से हम चाह तो यही रहते कि अभी भेजें लेकिन कुछ 
लोग नहीं ज़्यादा सर्टिफिकेट ले पाएंगे फिर तो हमारा है कि लोगों को ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा बेनिफिट दिया जाए जितना बेनिफिट हम दे सकते हैं तो आप सबका एक बार पुनः धन्यवाद और मैडम लोकेश आप परसों का ट्वेंटी फोर्थ का भी अनाउंस हाँ ट्वेंटी फोर्थ को हमारा एक और नेशनल वर्कशॉप है साइकोलॉजिकल वेलबींग ऑफ वीमेन ड्यूरिंग डिजास्टर इरा हमने शेयर किया है पोस्टर आप सभी के बीच में आप मैं फिर एक बार और उस पोस्टर को लगा दूँगा तो आप सब उस कार्यक्रम को ज्वाइन करें वो कार्यक्रम भी हमारा अच्छा कार्यक्रम है और एक ही सेशन का कार्यक्रम है एक दिन का कार्यक्रम है तो आप उस कार्यक्रम को ज्वाइन करें इसके अलावा फिर हम लोग एफ डी पी अनाउंस करेंगे कुछ जल्दी एक बड़ा कार्यक्रम तो आप तो उस कार्यक्रम को ज्वाइन कीजिएगा <laughs> जल्दी करते हैं अनाउंस कुछ ना कुछ बड़ा कार्यक्रम करते हैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक यू थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू थैंक यू मैम आपको दूसरी बार सुनने का मौका मिला पहली बार हमने मैडम को लाइव सुना था और वो तो कुछ अलग ही हवा थी उस समय तो सुनने की अलग ही लाइव में बहुत फर्क होता है वर्चुअल इज नॉट माय मीडियम आई एम वेरी रिलैक्सेंट टू कवर इट मैम इफ आई वांट टू नो मोर डिटेल्स अबाउट दिस कोर्सेस कैन आई कम बैक टू यू श्योर एनी टाइम एनी टाइम थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू माय प्रेशर या Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Thank, thank you, so thank you, Rajeshwar ma'am. Thank you. 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 Thank